Hello everyone, it's Oliver Harper here, back for a new commentary, and this week Ghostbusters expert and superfan Paul Gallen is joining me to provide a commentary track to the 2016 movie. You may know Paul from the YouTube channel Digitizer, hosted by Mr Biffo, and as the co-host on The Cheap Show. So Paul, how are you doing, and are you a big fan of this movie, or were you left disappointed? Hello, I'm alright, I'm not too bad, I'm actually looking forward to talking about this. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to lay out the stall now. I am a fan of Ghostbusters 2016, but I'm not here to do an apology video for it, because A, I don't think you need to, and B, I just want to talk about it in terms of... Uh, a film on its own. I want to tr talk about its pros and cons, and I actually just want to talk about it seemingly rationally without all the noise of social media and fans and geeks and, and all the arguments that I've heard since 2016. I just want to talk about it and just give it a proper rinse under the film microscope. That makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, I know where you're coming from, Paul. Yeah, yeah. It's trying to sort of discuss it without all the extra baggage that comes along with it. But I think some of that baggage will be discussed. But yeah, um, but it's more about does the film sort of stand on its own to a certain degree? Mm. And does it sort of um, does it sort of improve in some areas of the original sort of formula of Ghostbusters and where it sort of falters, I suppose? Yeah. And also, I just I, I, I don't want it to be like I, I'm trying to change anyone's mind with this commentary. I just want to talk about it from my point of view within the scope of franchises, the film itself, the, the people behind it, and also where it fits in with this interesting thing Sony tried to do with Ghost Core, which it's still, to some extent, struggling to do. Yes, yes, that is true, that is true. Okay, folks, if you wish to sync this podcast with your own copy of the film, bear in mind we are watching the theatrical cut. Put the timestamp to zero and press play now. Ah, there we go. Sony. I used to work for Sony Pictures in the UK. Did you? Was it part? Was that? <laughs> was that? Was that, was that part, of the, part of the marketing team? No, I I was working there uh, at around about the time the sh the film was celebrating its I want to say twenty fifth anniversary. I think so. It was a fair while ago, and I remember at the time um, Sony literally not knowing what to do. There was a few promotions and things like that and a few like bits of merch that they made, but um, there was all this pressure about getting it released on a special release or all this kind of stuff. But uh, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of Sony Pictures, which I may go into at some point in this video. Well, because Ghostbusters had been sort of the idea of a third one had been kicking around for so long. And it was always sort of said that Bill Murray was the one that sort of the problematic sort of piece of the puzzle that sort of delayed everything and stopped it from ever happening. Mm. Um, so it was this announcement that they were going to do essentially a reboot or essentially a remake, I suppose, of the 84 classic with all women involved. Did you, as a fan, was this something the the fan base were excited for? Was it they're just kind of a bit dubious about the prospect of a remake? No, this is one of these situations where you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. So... Um... Basically, the, the way you look at it is, is basically like this, is that Ghostbusters doesn't really fit in with the current way we're enjoying media and pop culture. So, you know, we've got the DC Universe and the Marvel Universe and the Star Trek Universe and Star Wars. For some reason, Sony thinks Ghostbusters is as good as that and can fit in that same world. But it's just literally, I, I think it's, it's it just, it's not, it's not possible. I don't think it's mm. literally possible for Ghostbusters to compete on those terms. And so when you've been sitting around for the best part of 20 years looking for a new adventure with, you know, your favourite characters, and then Sony turn around and say, oh, that's not happening now. Clean slate. Everyone involved in this film has nothing to do with the 84 film apart from executive producer credits. Then, yeah, fundamentally, your instinct is to go, oh, that sucks. Right. Well, yeah, because their first trailer they put out, the sort of teaser, indicated that it was in the same universe. And then they, they, they kind of messed that up, didn't they? Then they had to sort of correct themselves come the next one. And, and that's the, the problem with Sony in a nutshell, is that I honestly think they are awful at marketing and they are awful. I, I, this is the quick point I always like to make. I was working there where Quantum of Solace came out and I saw two or three different trailers for that film. And mm. one was really interesting experimental. One was kind of uh, a bit traditional, but at the same time, you know, it did a few interesting things with the score and how they edited it. And then there was one generic crap trailer. And I guarantee you, 
if you wanted to guess which one they picked, <laughs> you wouldn't have a hard time guessing. And I think it can't that's have the been same. the crap one. <laughs> no, God, it was the generic, horrible Sony trailer machine. I swear to God, you take any trailer that they do, any comedy trailer genre, any horror, any action, and they all have the same rhythm and structure to them. Yes, it's, it's also like a bit like Paramount's trailers with uh, things like Transformers. They're always kind of similar beats, and everyone uses kind of uses borrows and the same sound effects and things like that to sort of amp up the. Yeah. The volume and things like ramp up the speed of the picture and so forth. But this kind of opening sequence we have here, which is obviously a clear play on the old, the, the library, you know, in the first, in the original movie, um, with you see that the villains, as, we, as we'll discuss later on, has put these kind of devices to sort of bring back, well, to, to power up the paranormal, which is kind of hmm. a sort of steampunk kind of device, isn't it? I think it's, it's quite interesting. I, I Do you know what? F- f- I'll mention this now because I think it will come up again later, but I think where this film is more successful is where it tries to do its own thing and where it's Mm. unsuccessful is when it leans on callbacks or familiar iconography from the 84 film. And that's kind of the curse of Ghostbusters is that no matter what it does, it's always cursed by the success of the 84 film. The 89 film has the same problem. The Extreme Ghostbusters franchise had the same problem. And the fact that they've been trying to get another one made in all that time shows just how difficult it is to capture that lightning in a bottle. Something that I think we've talked about before with like sequels and things. Yeah, that's the thing thing with Ghostbusters, wasn't it? Because they... they, they even with Ghostbusters 2 they tried to repeat the sort of formula again and it just didn't work with audiences and they you know no. were, and, and the reviews were terrible for Ghostbusters 2 when it came out despite it doing well just based on the popularity of the IP at the time I think Ghostbusters um, 2 is more like comfort food rather than a proper cinematic adventure um, it's, a, it's a classic archetype of well classic structure of a, an 80s sequel isn't it given what they want again but. yeah slightly different twist i think this intro is hugely successful up until one point which only really annoys me so we've got this great sequence coming up now you've got the villain the ghosts approaching him a nice scream just like the library scene cuts the credits why the fuck did they not cut to the logo just like in the first two films yeah instead they go to this generic title sequence where they cut to a wide shot of the building then the logo then the the title should have gone with the you know big whoosh go logo bit yeah, and that really, really annoyed me. And that was major. If I have any huge bug first about this film, where I could put my little geek hat on and I go, "Oh, this is what I'd fix," it might just be that. Frankly, it's just little simple editing bits here and there, so you can make it a major improvement or something. I think because I watched this at the cinema, then I watched it again when it came out. I think on DVD or Blu-ray, Blu-ray, sorry, and then watched it again last night for the purpose of this commentary, and. I think the biggest problem I think with the film is actually kind of how it starts. I, I don't I don't think it's it really gets its f- f- uh, feet on the ground, so to speak. I think it's it's a bit mm. fumbly all the way through that part. So they actually get to do some ghost busting when it sort of becomes a little bit more enjoyable. I think. Yeah, um, I, I, it's it's interesting actually because again we don't want to go too much about scripts and different cuts and all this kind of stuff, but the theoretical cut does give a bit more story at the front end of the uh, movie, which does pay off later on in terms of it becomes a story about the two main characters of Aaron and Abby. Uh, Aaron and Abby, sorry. And um, that really pays off. But then that's kind of pulled out of this to get to the joke moment sooner. And as a result, I think it loses a lot of what I think think this has over the 84 film, which I think this film has a lot more heart and warmth to it than the 84 Mm. film does, which is a deeply cynical movie, which is its appeal. But this is what I think the 2016 does have, is it it kind of wants you to really fall in love with these characters. And whether Mm. you you do or not largely depends on, I think, what you think of the tone of this film. And I think the tone is what actually puts most people off, especially Ghostbusters fans. Tone, yeah, tone is its major issue, I think. And also, I think... If Ghostbusters, the movies, never existed and this was kind of its own thing or this was based on a cartoon, Mm. I think it would kind of, it it would have worked with people because if you compare the the, the photographic look of this movie and its its visual style, it's so much more cartoony and comic-y. I think it's done by DP who'd done like The Life Aquatic, which is a wonderfully lit movie, wonderful colours to it. Well, this is, it kind of follows in that sort of similar traits where the first... Ghostbusters felt a bit more like a documentary style filmmaking, very mm. smoky look to it. It captures New York in a very sort of particular way, which if you when you watch Ghostbusters, you think, well, that that's New York. That's the best. Yeah. Ghostbuster films are the best at representing New York mm. and the spirit of it. Um this doesn't this feels far more sort of uh, workmanlike in terms of its uh 
its presentation and its I would structure. say that I would say that's true. It feels sitcommy in some respect. Yeah. And yeah, again, this this is this comes from the whole inherent problem with Ghostbusters. In that, Ivan Reitman, I'm just going to go out and say it, isn't a very good director, if you ask me. I think he's a sitcom director. I think he frames shots quite flatly. There's not much depth of feel going on in a lot of his films. It's all very flat and pleasant and lovely and blocked. Whereas mm. he did something with Ghostbusters, which he hasn't, even in the sequel, been able to recreate, and that he creates this weird New York gothic uh, horror film comedy. And so it's, so it's cut more like a horror film than a comedy, whereas it's fundamentally a comedy film, but because the scenes are quite lackadaisical, the mm. rhythm, the humour fits the editing, whereas this is the opposite problem. Ghostbusters 2 is 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 shot and edited like a comedy. Yeah. And it's very sort of like, you said there's so many sort of interior shots of very kind of basic setups mm. in number two, where it's like they're kind of trying to whiz through it quite quickly. Um, as we see with the, with the new film, um, as you, also the gag reels that come with it on the Blu-ray, which it shows they're having a wonderful time making it. They're really mm. enjoying it. Um, but there is this, in, well, also what's come out of sort of um, trivia about the film is a lot of ad-libbing in the film. Yeah. Uh, so they've to try and, it's because in the first, in the original script, I'd imagine with Dan, Dan Aykroyd and Ramus's script was the, jo- the jokes were quite fine tuned, I think. And then if you kind of ad lib stuff on, on the day, you, it's a 50, 50 chance. It's one that's going to work and it's not going to work. And when it comes mm. to seeing it later on. Um, and I think this is kind of inherent with this, where there's some great gags in this. I did laugh. I, I still laugh at some of the gags in this movie, but there's some just fall completely flat where they've just gone a little bit too far. Yeah, with their the sort of uh, their creative freedom to sort of throw something else in. I I, th- I think that's that that's the weird thing about this film. In that I've read the original script, and I, the original script isn't too different from what was shot. But you do see where the improvisation is, and I kind of think it's it's a slight detriment to the script because what Paul Feig and Kate Dippold wrote was a really solid, character rich comedy that did its best to reinvent the Ghostbusters um, mm. but when you throw in all these performers you've got Melissa McCarthy you've got you know uh, Kate McKinnon all are great improvisers and have had experience of Saturday Night Live and rolling with the punches I kind of get I think it gives the voice of the film over to the comedians rather than the writer or the director and so whilst it is very much a Paul Feig film. Ultimately, you're going to like this film if you like Paul Feig films. And it's interesting. Some of the people that I've shown this to, like um, who are Ghostbusters fans who didn't like this, I've also shown this film to people who don't like Ghostbusters fans but like Bridesmaids and, and Spy and love this. In fact, their only complaint was that it's a bit too kiddie for them compared to Bridesmaids and Spy and whatnot. So... It, it, it's it's interesting. I think they should have lent p- more trust in the script. Yes, because uh, yeah, uh, Paul Feig's work, I you know, I I bridesmaids hilarious. Spy, the extended version, especially, is, is a mm. brilliant film. It's, it's, I piss myself laughing watch, watching that. But it's, I, I I don't think he was the wrong choice for Ghostbusters because if you, if you, it's always kind of hindsight now because yeah, no, at the time, no one knew what Ghostbusters was going to be about, so no one thought, "Oh, Ivan Reitman's not the right guy for the job." If it's a comedy, it's the right mm. guy for the job. Um, so it's it's obviously just down to really sort of the, the creative control and what he, what his clear vision was for this picture. I mean, it's, it's um, I mean, in terms of its ideas and how it looks and how it plays out, I suppose there isn't there isn't inherently a clear vision for this, but it's uh, it's kind of like it's 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 got so much pressure on its shoulders to sort of yeah. compare itself to the other films and please the fan base and provide something different. And it, oh, it it's, as you said earlier, I think it, the original stuff actually kind of works for itself, but then yeah. everything else surrounding it, which is kind of repeating itself from from before, it just becomes like a, you've heard the joke before sort of mm. thing, you know? And, and I, I, I've seen so many videos on YouTube about people who say, go woke, go broke, and all these kind of, this is what's ruining modern cinema because X, Y, and Z, and women are ruining everything. Look at Birds of Prey. Oh, no, look at the this, that. And you just think to yourself, art in that respect doesn't exist in the bubble you're putting it in. When people have grievances about a film when it comes to race or gender, I think it's largely an argument that stops you from talking about the details in the film that do matter. And I think, 
you know, just looking at it as a fantasy adventure with four women who are the superheroes of this film and save the day, that in itself is very, very rare in cinema. And it mm. wasn't really until Wonder Woman the following year broke all the box office that people were like, oh, yeah, a woman can carry a movie. That's a popcorn, you know, pop culture movie. And you think, no, that's not particularly true because you can look at Aliens and Sigourney Weaver completely carries that film or Linda Hamilton in T2. So it's more about, I think, gatekeeper fan bases by and large being vocal enough to say, we know what's good for the franchise and this isn't good for the franchise. Mm. Do you think it was um, their attitude was just like, we're going to do Ghostbusters, we're just going to do it just, just with women this time? Was that their... If, that's their, if that was their only goal, then it, it's a bit of a sort of flawed, um, I think, direction and conception to do that. I, I honestly think that that wasn't what Sony would have wanted. I think if, if the Sony board room people sat down and was presented with this their instinct was to say probably no I spoke to Paul Fegan and went up to the release of the movie and he was very kind to invite me to an interview where I could just talk to him and we talked about half an hour and one of the things he stressed was the reason why the film exists in this state with these characters is because um, Sony basically went we've had 20 years to develop a third Ghostbusters movie Every script Dan Aykroyd's done has been shit, and I've read one of them, and it was. If you want to see a bad, if you want to read a bad Ghostbusters script, read Ghostbusters Go to Hell or whatever it was called, because it was packed with jargon, had too many characters in that didn't have any time to last an impact, the plot wasn't very good, and uh, long story short, you're just wading through jargon and characters until you get to the familiar, oh, New York's going to blow up again, right? Um <laughs> I forgot what my original point was now, but I. I <laughs> what was my original point? It, it was it was the, the point of like you know was this just a sort of cynical attempt to sort of say okay we're just gonna have women in it instead of men just to sort of do something yeah. that's kind of uh, a popular sort of choice I suppose. No, Paul Feig said he just basically wanted a blank slate, and he, in his opinion, his blank slate was new new universe, new characters. Um, a complete blank slate because he said he wanted to give these characters a sense of uh, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for he wanted to give them the right to be Ghostbusters so if they just turned up and inherited all the missed stuff from the guys from 84 yeah. you kind of make them redundant and then they just become you know placeholders for this franchise yeah. so he goes if I give them their own tech they're smartest their own technology their own discoveries their own you know investigations then you see them grow and I think that is a great idea because if I have any problems with the franchise of Ghostbusters in general, is that it's linked to 84 so much that people... I mean, okay, so I've kind of been quiet about my Ghostbusters uh, afterlife thoughts and feelings. But when I saw mm. the trailer, a part of me did go, oh, there's a Goza dog in it and oh, they're doing the Goza story again and it's a legacy sequel. And it's like, God, what I wouldn't give for something new for these characters to deal with that isn't based on 84 because every toy that comes out is based on 84 every re-release is the 84 re-release gets it well it's, it's like just... the video game that dealt more with the backstory of uh shandor the sort of architect of things and i thought that was very interesting i thought exploring more of that history because in ghostbusters the original film the villain itself is kind of we also we get zool at the end but it, we only get a little bit of backstory about the architect and so forth when they're in prison which becomes yeah. a sort of classic sort of ghost story around a campfire sort of moment um, that was it. So the, the the video game sort of did expand that quite quite nicely. This sort of sequence here, which obviously you know again is it plays on the sort of the, the original film. I, Melissa McCarthy's sort of PKE meter is a bit like the one from the the cartoon, isn't it? It's, it's actually a bit like the one from Extreme Ghostbusters the, as well. The toy you get, you know. Yeah. So I love that prop. One thing I will say about this film is that I absolutely love the technology in it because. Again, going back to that Ghostbusters complaint I have, is that Ghostbusters 2 kind of reinvented the wheel in terms of it just did the same thing again, but now it had slime blowers. This is a film where they actually bust ghosts. They actually bust them, not trap them. They destroy them and turn them into goo. And I was like, oh, yeah. I hadn't really thought about that before. <laughs> they should be called Ghost Keepers. What did you think of the the, sort of the visual effects and, to, and, with, and with the ghosts? Because it, it seems to... I mean, I, I think the visual effects in the movie actually are pretty consistent and pretty good. Mm. I think, I suppose the, the, the ghosts themselves are far more sort of 
neon bright colors now they're far more sort of uh colorful and a bit more uh have a bit more of a wow factor to them because obviously yeah. pushing the sort of 3d elements they do within the movie i think for i don't I think they post converted it to 3d i think um, yeah but obviously the video game itself the, the one on the xbox and playstation the ghost did sort of have a similar design to what we're seeing in this as well so oh um, yeah i i love the way they did the ghosts in this because people go oh too much cgi too much cgi and i'm thinking a um don't complain about that when you just went to see Avengers Endgame, which is nothing but a basically st- string of uh, video game cutscenes put together. And secondly, there's not as much CGI in this film as people probably think. There's... All right, I'll rephrase that. There's not enough CGI where they think it is. There's too much CGI where it doesn't need to be. All right? So I'll mm. say that the budget of this film was so big because they, they filmed it like they were trying to film an Avengers movie. And so... You've got all the Times Square sequence at the end, which is practically a giant green screen set, because you know you yes. can't film in Times Square, and I can't. Well, they've got like destroyed that. rubble, haven't they? And cars that's yeah. within camera, and all the ghosts themselves. If you see behind the scenes stuff, even the gag reels, they yeah. actually have an actor being the ghost who's got covered all these little lights on. I him love that. Of... That's so effective. That's, that's good. I didn't realise they did that. So that was um, a good effort on the visual effects. Yeah, team. most of the ghosts in there are actors in costume with a light rig, you know, and. That, that, you know, even Ghostbusters 2 was still people in costumes and suits, so it's not uncommon. I love. I don't. I don't particularly like this moment here. I think that when they celebrate, it just, it just seems a little bit. You know, the tone's a bit off, and it's a bit silly. Um, and it, it obviously smash cuts to a very serious moment where she's going to get fired. But mm. that's also it's a comedic edit. But it's we were introduced obviously to Charles Dance earlier, and this is, I think it's the last time we see him in this cut. Oh, right, he only extended one. Yeah. <laughs> it's more he would, he would have been a great villain, I think. He's one of the greatest villains of, of action cinema, last action heroes in The Golden Child. And, and you know, wonderful in Alien 3. Uh, mm. And it's a shame he doesn't like become, you know, he's maybe a relation or someone or an ar- of the architect, maybe if they're following that route, or he has some sort of stake in this. Um, this goes back to the issue I had with the different cuts of this, because somewhere in the middle, there's a brilliant cut of Ghostbusters answer the call and the theatrical cut doesn't quite get it and the director's cut doesn't quite get it and the two fan cuts I've seen don't quite get it and so there's there's <laughs> which cut is it then Paul well this is the problem because Paul Fink said there's a three hour cut of this and as much as I love this film I'm not sitting through three hours of this <laughs> you know <laughs> some very extended comedic showreel I, 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 I barely can sit through three hour cut of any bloody movie let alone one that you know is a light comedy um, but yeah there's much more Charles Dance because it goes back to the whole thing about the characters of uh, Melissa McCarthy and uh, Kristen Wiig in that they've got this uh, friendship that was built on trust from a kind of childhood being bullied thing Um they meet in these circumstances where they, they kind of have to repair their friendship over the course of their film, over their differences of you know process. And Charles Dance popped in every now and then as a kind of um, devil on Christian Riggs' shoulder in that what she really wants to do is be taken seriously in her field, but she can't because of her association with the paranormal. And so there's a scene later on where, uh, I can't remember exactly where it happens, but I think there's a scene where uh, Kristen, Wiig punches, Kristen Wiig punches a guy on the street there's all this fuss going on, and she, but she wants to get her job back at the uh, university because she's now proven this technology works, going against Abby's wishes. And so when she comes out of that meeting, realising that she's been set up by Charles Dan to look like a dick again, that's when Abby confronts her about the, the quality of this friendship by saying, look, you're either in this with me or you're trying to go to harvard or whatever it is and it, it's just really it's a real it's a, one of the things i really again i will defend is that i liked the characters of all the characters in this of the main crew and i think their through line of that friendship is something important and lacking from the franchise before because ultimately mm. it's the bill murray show with added stars and special effects well yeah because in the, in the original ones it's because it's kind of Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray are, are friends, but sort of, it's kind of like Dan Aykroyd's character sort of puts up with Peter, essentially, put, put, puts up with Bill. Mm. Uh, but then you've got another friendship, which is Dan Aykroyd and Howard Rames' characters. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's kind of they all work together, but there's kind of, there's, they have their own separate pairings of friendships, I think, yeah. and what, how they sort of, you know, bounce off each other. Um, I, there's a moment we just saw, actually, where they, uh, the TV show Ghost Jumpers. Yeah. Which was, because I thought to myself, I forgot that that was in it, but I, I thought maybe they would address that and have some sort of comment on, 
you know haunted tv shows which like in the uk we have most haunted in america they have that guy who wears, wears those stupid hipster glasses and oh yeah ghost it. adventures yeah it's terrible um so it's good they addressed that and they're looking for what was it the ghost of like bigfoot or something like that on the yeah. tv <laughs> <laughs> that was a good gag this this it, it it's it's funny because we go back to that improvisational thing again and i think like people kind of go oh well the improvised ghostbusters and it was funny and it's like no no what they did was they wrote a script that was tailored brilliantly to those actors and bill murray may have improvised one or two lines and takes you know what i mean it's not like mm. this where i would say long stretches of dialogue are actually improvised around the script which again makes this film i think again one of the complaints about it is it makes it feel baggy it makes it f- feel like certain scenes could have been done better with more concise performances and trust in the script yes there's um this thing i've sort of noticed while watching it again recently was that in original ghostbusters the core cast were funny they had the funny lines it has rick moranis Mm. and everyone else around them was played very straight in this world this this ghostbusters everyone is kind of goofy and wacky yeah. outside of the core cast and i think that's the problem i think for me in terms of its tone yeah. it's complete it's it it, it it doesn't create a believable world for a start hmm. so it ends up it, it knows well maybe that's obviously paul paul feig's kind of choice and direction was to do that but i think um if it to be taken sort of seriously as a sort of sci-fi comedy and, and slash horror hmm. um to have the rest of this kind of world be taken seriously and um, not so goofy would have, I think, would have benefited it. It's an odd one because this film definitely exists in the same universe as Spy or The Heat. You know, it's got yeah. that, it's got that familiar Paul Feig world where everyone's a character, for better or worse. Even that guy in the background who says two lions, he's he's got something going on. And I think you're right. I think when you have stakes like these in a film, you've got to have some sort of normalcy for the mad action to bounce around within. And I think when everything's cartoony, then yes. It, it Again, it comes down to tone. I genuinely think it's a tone thing. If you go into this and you don't like the tone, every inch of it's going to be painful for you. Whereas, yeah. and that's also with the baggage of the films beforehand. Whereas if this had just been called Ghost Smashers, you'd never been, never heard of Ghostbusters and this was the film that came out, I don't think we'd been having quite the number of online conversations about it than people like to have. One problem I think the filmmakers had, or maybe the the cast had, was their sort of reaction to the negativity, which they, sh- they shouldn't have said nothing. They should have said nothing in regards to uh, the fans complaining online, because mm. when, when they turn against them and say all oh, these guys living in their basements and and so forth complaining, um, they they lump a lot of the fan ba- fan base into one category, and uh, but it's that category of people that buy the merchandise buy the film, go see it, and they're the ones who obsess over it and buy all the stuff they want to make money from. So, But then the counter-argument to that is, why should you placate those kind of voices? I know that broad, yeah, general, yeah. sweeping yeah, comments yeah, aren't yeah. positive, but if you're Leslie Phillips and you've dealt with day after day of month after month of racist, sexist stuff, I, I, I think it's hard to mo- modulate your language you know what I mean when you've got yeah, that on yeah. your shoulders. It's, it's the flip side, yeah, of the of the coin. But I I, I think it was just what, if if it's supposed to, if it's a social media thing directed at one person, then then it's it's. But they you know she can decide to do what she wants in that regard. But I think in terms of when they're all like, like all together on a chat show to talk about it, and then they sort of fire back at the at the fans. I mean, it's like I, but, I think for me. Now, in my shoes, if I was in there, I'd be t- it'd be too risky. <laughs> to it it, me, it is risky, full yeah. stop. But I don't. The interesting thing is that the, those comments about this film and that story it is that the, the overall. This is the problem. So from from day one, when Sony released the news that this is going to be a, a, a female led franchise reboot, whatever you want to call it, I think they dropped the ball in how they de- dedicated and delivered that message, and from word go they were dealing with negative press full stop mm. it didn't it, it this i mean people go on about oh it was a flop and it didn't do very well no it got reviewed very well and in terms of budget yes it didn't make avengers money but by all accounts it cleaned its face and it didn't lose sony money um mm. and i hate those arguments because like oh yeah you know the thing was absolutely hated and flopped at the box office does that mean it's still shit now or can you reevaluate it without the pressure of the franchise or talking at the moment so the message from the word go was negative on this film and it didn't matter how good or bad this film was going to be that was the that was the message 
for this franchise. And we mm. live in a we live in a world now where it's like half the discussions we have about film or a film in general are finished with the minute that film gets released and we move on to the next film we're going to complain about and second guess and you know all of that crap. And it gets to the point yeah. where I got tired defending this film online because it's one thing to say I didn't like this film. And if you didn't like this film, I'm not here to change your mind or tell you you're wrong. That's fine. But what I don't like is people online g- telling me or telling other people who like it that they're wrong. And that's mm. the real thing that bugs me about this. Because now I feel like I can't enjoy something without some idiot halfway around the world attached to his keyboard telling me in blunt language why I'm wrong and an idiot and a woke mm. supporter and all this kind of horrible shit. When it's just like... I just like it because it made me laugh, and I like Ghostbusters, and I liked all the equipment, and I thought the plot was nice. Is it as good as Ghostbusters? Of course not, you idiot. Is it better than Ghostbusters 2? I happen to think so. <laughs> I, I, I think we... we I suppose the comparisons of Ghostbusters 2, it's... Uh, I mean, I think there's, there's less fans of that movie, so I think there'll be less of a, of a kickback with that. Um, but I he, think now, also, the introduction of Chris Hemsworth, you know, he's... Um, you know the guy of the team is pleased to be a complete idiot. But also, <laughs> kind of he kind of outshines them all really in his in his in his comedy. He's it's uh, also we knew he's. I think for the filmmakers at Marvel, they knew he was obviously very good at comedy. Come like Thor Ragnarok, it clearly shows he's good at comedy timing. Mm. Um, obviously, he did this before Thor Ragnarok, and uh, and he's he knocks it out of the park. And I just wish actually he was actually part of the team, just a complete. Maybe dial down him being a complete idiot. But. Yeah, well, that that's my problem with him, is that he gets some very good lines in this film. But at the same time, <laughs> he's a bit too dumb. And when we talk about every character in this being yeah. uh, cartoony, which, I again, I don't personally have a problem with, because that's your universe, that's your tone, that's your palette. Um, when it comes to his character, it's like, oh, can we not have everything he done do be so incredibly dumb because then you worry about how it even functions in the world of your crazy world uh, when it's yeah, yeah because when he attempts to grab the phone from the you know the fish tank i'm like that's a bit too far with pushing his stupidity i think yeah but i, I do recall there was a big laugh when he rubs his eyes he puts his finger through the that's a great gag through his glasses frame and that's all you kind of need in many respects um and so i don't know because yes there is an argument here to be um, how many times have you seen a blonde bimbo secretary character in movies, in, in pop culture in general? Uh, that whole character exists to be ditzy and silly and, you know, that. And that's what they're doing here, isn't it? And that's you know? what they're doing here. But I think the problem is, is that, again, it's, it feels like it's a bit like it's baiting in many respects. And it's like, where does it go from being a character to being an attack on tropes? And if you're going to be an attack on a trope is... Is that humour the best way to approach it? And I think he could have just snipped a few lines here or there, a few little moments here and there, kept the core of his stupidity, but make him at least functional. Like, my favourite gag of his in this whole film is, like, where he holds up two photographs of him topless with a saxophone, and he goes, which which one makes me look like a doctor? (laughs) You know, he's got a saxophone, he's got, like, a flute or whatever it is. And I I like, because I I like the way his brain doesn't work. (laughs) And he's got to go to take part in a hide and seek competition, you know. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was great. Yeah. The gags, you know, they they do fire because you've got a you've got a good comedic director. But I suppose it's with the original Ghostbusters. I think the comedy was very subtle. It wasn't so in yeah. your face. It was just like if you. It, it's like the beauty of the, of that of that movie is the more you watch it. You find little gags here and there you've missed before, mm. and I that's that, that's why I think it's it works so well. Um, yeah, no, Ghostbusters is, is an incredibly subtle film when you, in comparison to what we expect of a blockbuster now, it's like it's like Back to the Future as well. It's like when you think about it, nothing really happens in Back to the Future for a good hour, and then and you know because it, it's mostly just very sitcommy adventure, and only in the last twenty minutes are the stakes implied and you get the edge of the seat ending but like if you try to release a film with absolutely no set pieces in it until you're fin- oh, I mean maybe the skateboard chase in the middle but even so it's like by today's standards kids would be going oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it, it's interesting that we find the pace of a film do you think the um the sort of uh, branding and um you know 
commercial names been thrown in, sort of advertising is a bit tasteless in this film. No, because it's Sony. And every time I see a bloody Sony movie, whether it's Adam Sandler or James Bond or whenever, they've, they've got a Sony laptop on. and <laughs> Phone as well. Yeah, a phone. It, it's like, I, Camera. yeah. I, yeah. It's all there. I, I get it. It's it's it can be intrusive, but then this is one of my inherent problems with Sony. Where I just think they're a shit movie studio. <laughs> it's it's just it's just that's what I think. The only franchises they had are Ghostbusters and Bond, and they lost Bond because I think now what Universal. I don't think Bond? they were making enough. I don't think I think was, I think MGM had a bigger stake in the profits. I think so. I think that's kind of why Sony was just like, ah, oh, we're not gonna renew it. You know the, yeah. like, the distributing deal. I think that's why Universal have got it now. Fair um, enough. But MGM I... don't. MGM don't hardly put out any movies. So it's these are MGM's. Are, it's been a shadow of its former self for years. Yeah, um, it, it's funny how it all kind of works out with who owns what and where. But I mean, like, uh, look, Ghostbusters was a strange anomaly, not just for the fact that it was a comedy genre supernatural adventure film for adults and kids, but mostly sold to kids. But adults were the ones who got it, quote unquote. But it was also released from Columbia Studios, who really didn't have a track record with the kind of films Paramount and 20th Century Fox were making no, no, in terms no. of tentpole films. And so Columbia becomes Sony because all that built, you know, business deals. Well, they owned by Coke, weren't they, at one yeah, point? Wasn't it? which is why yeah. Ghostbusters 2 was draped in Coca-Cola merchandise. Um, <laughs> but I just, I don't know. I honestly think Sony just don't know what they're they, to do with franchises i don't know if they even know what to do with big budget movies mm. i mean what was the biggest like success that they've had they've had mostly comedy movies and the odd cgi film be successes it'd be, but... be spider-man wasn't it? spider-man was their thing for a long time oh yeah it? that went um, well for them until um... they had to literally beg with a, with open hands to marvel to <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's true it's true i mean it, it, um, I see, an interesting thing i like about this one is with the production design they've actually thrown throwing quite a lot of art deco stuff which is kind of fits within New York, doesn't it? Um, and it's sort of the melding at the end of like the past and the present where you've mm. got... Well, I, I forgot, completely forgot when I looked at it, I went, they've got Woolworths in it. I was like, what? Yeah. I thought to myself, wait a minute, are they still around in America? I said, oh no, they've actually, it's mixed the past with the present. Mm. Um, but again, here, the guy who designs the logo, which is like another wacky sort of character, who's, you know, he's, he's funny, he's great, he's yeah. a good performance of him. But it's, yeah, as I say, it's sort of, caters to my argument that everyone else outside the, the, the core cast are, are funny as well. Yeah, um, and I, I, I mean, I like this scene where they come up with the logo. I really thought that was cute. And actually, as a visual image, I love that shot of her walking off and the thing. It's, it, I suppose, it, yeah, because in the, in the first film, we always can, we, 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 can't, we are going to have to keep saying back when, you know, with the first film. Um, a lot of the, how things were made, how things were designed, nothing's shown to you. It's just like, they get the money. Ray takes out like what five mortgages or whatever. This yeah. is kind of a, a comment on the times, you know, during the Reagan era. People were encouraged to sort of borrow money far more than they could actually afford. Um, and then there's something that they've made this technology, and then they've got the logo and, and so forth. And, so and then the next uh, time you see it, they're in the the, the the Cedric Hotel, ready to go with their pro on packs. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's it's what they're doing is what you know, modern movies do. They try to actually give a little bit more of a backstory to things. And some people who are, you know, I, I suppose, we've all done this before when we've seen a remake and gone, oh, you don't, do we really need to see how, I don't know, Wolverine got his jacket, you know, <laughs> or something, you know, <laughs> yeah. little things that come into it. But the daft thing um, is, is that if, <laughs> like, for instance, I remember a year or two ago, uh, Dan Aykroyd saying, oh, I want to make a Ghostbusters prequel where you get to meet them at university. And I was like, why? Nothing would happen. You'd just be making Animal House <laughs> with those characters played by a younger crew of male actors. And it's just like, because the origin story of Ghostbusters is Ghostbusters. They see their first ghost. They figure out the... Te you know what I mean? It's like... But it's like, it's, aren't they talking about doing a a Robocop TV series set in Detroit before he was Robocop? Yeah. So I don't... Eddie, Alex Murphy won't be there? So I, call, I call it the Prometheus <laughs> logic of making movies, where it's like, we're going to give you a backstory to, to something we don't need the backstory to, because it inherently takes away the mystery or thrill of, of discovery. 
Yeah, we're going to tell you. <laughs> but in this case, I actually think it was wise for them to do this because you don't see that in the 84 film. You don't see them, so quote unquote, earning their wings because I like the fact that you see the technology go from Mark 1 proton pack here to Mark 2, which has got its name. And I forgot what the bloody name of the Mark 2 proton pack is, but each one's slightly different. So by the time you get to the finale, they've got the final pack. And so there's like three stages of pack you see in this film, mm. which I love. And I love the first generation pack with all the exposed wires and again I love the design of the equipment in this movie I, I think it's beautiful and I think they get I mean that shot there oh, this is where I kind of this is this is my tug and tull tug and pull so I know I talk a lot about this but I'm passionate <laughs> but it's like for every problem that I have with this film that I echo in the fan base at large there's stuff like this which I absolutely love I love the look of this shot that shot there where he reaches forward is it almost exactly the same as the Scarelli Brothers shot in Ghostbusters 2 yes it is it is it's very Scarelli Brothers isn't it yeah oh my god it's the Scarelli Brothers yeah. boom you know, and I, and I remember this scene being really effective the trains coming in they're catching a ghost I, I was I remember, I've still got a little bit of goosebumps in the back of my neck actually watching this bit back now. And it ends with a really cracking gag where, you know, that, wherever it's going, it's going to... There's a lot of, because in terms of, as, as I mentioned earlier about the sort of very sort of pop colour style to it, very sort of pastel colours as well. Mm. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of scenes actually take place during the day in a very, very brightly coloured day. Like later, when we see them go to their first sort of working gig, as it were, to capture that big dragon thing. Why is there a rock concert during the day? Usually that's a nighttime thing people want to go to. And it's, it's well, kind of weird uh, choices why they do that. It's a rock festival, so it's taking place throughout the day. There's other bands and stuff going on. So there you go. I hate to correct you, but I just did. <laughs> 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 um, but yeah, yeah. Uh, but but again, that's, oh, that's a frustrating scene as well, because that's it's Sedgwick Hotel moment. And I think it goes back to my issue where it's edited like a comedy and not like a, a horror film or action film. Whereas Ghostbusters got away with that because of its tone and its pace. This, as a result, feels a little bit like it rushes at times and it stumbles over itself. Because You also think that how they how are they funding this project at the moment? Because there's, they haven't discussed about taking out a loan, have they? Uh, well, I mean, I can't remember. There might have been a cut. I think there might be footage somewhere about how they explain that. But, but then what again, they could have done is because they've shot all this, they're shooting these videos for YouTube. You know, I think one clip they put up has like seven million views. I suppose they could have made their money by advertising. I know, right? Like, <laughs> ad rev on these videos, you know. Yeah, because YouTube don't mind about what if you get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. It's all you know interaction at the end of the day. And it's a little comment there as well where they were like reading the comments on these videos, going just ignore it. You yeah. know, that was a, I think that's a nice little bit they've put in to sort of deal with uh, social media sort of backlash, I suppose. I guess it's it's just odd that no other film that I can think of has had to do more work just to kind of defend itself when it doesn't need to. And no, I feel so sorry yeah, for it, it because that, yeah. I've got a giant bugbear when people complain about this movie and they say it's shit and ha 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 and it's killed the franchise and whatever, whatever people say about it. Um, and then I look at like Justice League and I see a film that was miserable to watch, miserable to sit through, badly made, and yet it somehow managed to get what route is rumored to be close to 80 million to reshoot it and then put it up on HBO mm. Max and I go how is it that horrible flop is allowed to somehow mm. have all this money dumped into it and I guarantee you making this Justice League thing is a massive money sink I think for HBO I think are going the Netflix model of going what are people talking about online that's popular quite quick all right make that and then we'll cancel it one season later and we'll move on to the next thing we can yeah, interest yeah. people in. We, we should, people should start baiting them by saying, "Oh, like a new hashtag, of like Rosie and Jim. Just bring Rosie and Jim back. The Netflix do it. <laughs> you, know? What's I, this? I, you know, it doesn't surprise me though, because it's like Dark Crystal, universally loved. Maybe didn't make as much money as it wanted to in terms of luring in people to the p platform, but then dumping it and moving on to the next thing, and dumping it and moving on to the next thing. So, like, I, I feel like when a show starts on Netflix, I can't invest in it because I don't know if it will be around mm. next year. Uh, I think it's time, by the way, now to talk about Kate McKinnon and how she is the MVP of this by some considerable margin. Yeah, yeah, by all means, far because, away. Paul. Because uh, it's 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 one of these things where I, I think everyone's putting their all in, and I would say without Kate McKinnon, this film would be a damn sight worse to sit through. 
because Kate yeah, McKinnon's yeah. energy in this, because Kate McKinnon said in a bunch of interviews leading up to this, is like when she was a kid, she loved science, she loved making gadgets, and she was a huge Ghostbusters fan. And now she got to play that mad scientist character she remembered being a kid. And I think that shows in this film because, like, she's a really interesting character in terms of uh, she's 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 kind of like Bugs Bunny in this. Yeah. And I I like the fact they don't overuse her too much. They just need her to kind of her enthusiasm gets you through the exposition, the techno babble, because I think yes. a lot of that could slow a film down. Whereas this, it's like here's a mad scientist talking about some tech. So even if you don't understand it, you understand that a character understands it, and that's all that matters in terms of what this world needs. And okay, so here's the other thing as well. Oh God. By the way, I talk a lot, so I apologise if I'm hogging all this up. But um, when I went to Ghostbusters <laughs> Fan Fest last year, it was interesting because they had a director's panel. And um, Paul Feig is amazingly gracious. And one of the th- couple of the things that pissed me off was one guy um, went out of his way to say to Paul Feig, can I have a picture of me pretending to kick you up the bottom and saying you ruined Ghostbusters? And Paul Feig went, yeah. Oh, that's... that's, that's- Really? Yeah, and he went, yeah, and he took the picture and he was white, smiling. And, like, that's Paul Feig in a nutshell. So he turns up Well, to... you told me he's, he's been quite, um, you know, sort of supportive and uh, forthcoming with Ghostbuster fans, hasn't he? He hasn't yeah. been... Hasn't that's... shielded himself from all of that. No, uh, well, this, this this is the interesting thing, is that, like, he, he turned up at FanFest and there was a director's panel. It was him, Ivan, and Jason Reitman. And, uh, obviously... You could sense in the room that people kind of felt to some extent, uh, oh, he shouldn't be here. But you look out across that, that that area where everyone was sitting, and it was like a couple, you know, a couple of hundred seats. There was at least a quarter of those people, females dressed in the twenty six Union uniform, who had come to the franchise through this film and loved mm. Paul Feig. And there was also the, a large percentage of Ghostbusters fans there who loved Paul Feig's movie. And so I, I, I realised at FanFest that necessarily the online discussion isn't necessarily the fan-based discussion. Because mm. I tend to find with fan bases across the board, and particularly in Ghostbusters, which was one of the reasons why I just stopped having these conversations with people online, is that there's a sense of gatekeeping. There's a sense of this is mine and I know what's good for it. And if you don't do it to my, you know, I'm going to roast you. And I think those fans don't necessarily represent the franchise. They represent the idea of gatekeeping pop culture. Yes. And so I spoke to a few people. There's one woman I spoke to, and she, she's going to be in the book that I'm uh, writing about Ghostbusters and Ghost oh, Hunting. Yes. Um, and she said she came out of an abusive marriage and she had troubles getting her kid off her husband. And she worked in science. And she said it was, she, her, her husband basically bullied her because she was smarter than him. And um, anyway... 2016, she's divorced, she takes her kid to see Ghostbusters, and she goes, on the screen, I saw myself in Kate McKinnon's character, in Holtzman. And oh, really? all of a sudden, it's like, I felt like, oh, I'm being represented to some extent on stage. And so she said she she never done it before, but she started cosplaying, and she said she built her own proton pack, and she did. She showed me the one she built, and God damn, it was amazing. And I spoke really? to her for a long time about what this film meant to her. And she goes, yeah, but I don't care about Ghostbusters 84, I like Ghostbusters 84, but that wasn't the film that spoke to me. And I think that's the other discussion that we forget. It's like, forget about fans. What about the new people who watch this for the first time? The kids. I went to see this at a press screening with uh, hundreds of kids, uh, and they loved it. They were, you know, kids aren't a great judge. No, maybe they don't, but you know how many kids actually love Phantom Menace, unironically? The kids attach themselves to things, you know, at a certain age. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, it's it's... It's as we just sort of saw this moment here where they've uh, the gig started and the, the main villain's gone in to set up the little the device. Again, I mean they've they have an interesting villain. I think that is, I mean it's, it's a I suppose a typical sort of trait of a character, a guy who was bullied, so he's going to fight back and destroy the world mm. in his own way, so, so he can become the ruler of this kind of paranormal uh, universe. I suppose. Um, They've, they've introduced an interesting nugget there, but don't actually fully develop him. And they, I think that is a, a kind of a fault of... Well, that's... I suppose it's, it's, like, it's like the original one, isn't it? When, when we discussed it, I mentioned it earlier about how the video game explored more of more of the architect and so forth, where 
this well, one could have had the opportunity to do that. I mean, there is a director's obviously in the theater, uh, the director's cut. There are a few more scenes with him. There's one really good one because apparently all the ghosts that he's storing in the basement are sli- sl- like slipping out and escaping into the building. So there's a scene where he goes up to a room to hear about a complaint, and there's a woman saying, "Oh, um, will you do this?" And then when she turns around, she's got a demon in her back trying to get out of his skin and he's kind of go yeah don't don't worry we'll send someone up to sort that problem out and it, it you know and then he goes back down to tell off the ghost for escaping so there's all these oh, little right. moments oh okay I should have watched the extended one, shouldn't I? Well, it's interesting because I think the extended one has positives, but also it has much more negatives for me in that they change lines that actually work in the theatrical cut. They change edits that... They do that, don't they? Because I remember I watched Anchorman 2 and like the theatrical cut and the extended one, they had the same scene, but they've just used a different line and the line wasn't as good as it as no. in the theatrical version. I'm like, what did you do that? Well, that's an it's improv really issue bizarre. where everything's too good to waste, so they'll stick it in the direction. Yeah. So there's a few lines at the beginning of the film that Zach Woods says, um, which I loved, uh, but in the director's cut, for, he, they changed those lines for alternate dialogue, and I was like, that doesn't work as well for me. What do you think of the music that's kind of thrown into this movie? Because obviously the score's done by uh, George Shapiro, isn't it? Uh, um, Theo? George Theo, was it Theo? I can't move. Oh, I can never remember, but I did want to talk about his score because I think it is friggin' brilliant. If you ever listen to the soundtrack, it, it is absolutely. Oh, it's Theodore brilliant. Shapiro. Sorry, yes, Theodore Shapiro. Because I, I I've, I've listened to the score. I do own it. I, I think it is a very good score. Um, it's, I suppose it's a little bit more heroic sort of a, a attempts at at sort of for the Ghostbusters because um, the original one by Emil Bernstein, which is a wonderful instrument he uses. That sort the of the theremin. Theremin, yeah, 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 which became like the thing he always used. Like, if you mm. listen to the Black Cauldron score, it's, yeah. it sounds like Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, um, and obviously, what was missing in number two was Elmer's work. Also, we've got Randy Edelman's uh, sort of work, which is actually, I, I do like his music for Ghostbusters too. But then again, that seemed to be Sick somewhat inspired, as well. by, inspired by the real Ghostbusters yeah. sort of approach to uh, the score, the scoring. Um, but this one, it's, uh, yeah, a bit traditional score done in a very heroic sort of way. I, I love the score to this. It, 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 to me, it, it, it's a brilliant marriage of uh, the score from the first film because it does share a lot of motifs with the original score. But it's also got a slight Avengers superhero thing going on. But it's also got a beautiful Disney's Haunted Mansion feel. It's got that delicate kind of creepy, spooky, sleepy hollow feel to it which I think gives this film a lot more identity than just the visuals because the opening piece of music that they use for this film is great and then when we get to the Times Square battle when he folds in the Ghostbusters song itself into Kate McKinnon's you know Smackdown scene to me that is the best Ghostbusters scene on film full stop and I don't care who gets oh really I said I wasn't I'm in the mindset of like there's some songs so if something's done electronic, whatever, and you do an orchestral version of it, I mm. don't think it works sometimes. Like in the case of like Terminator 3, the end titles has Brad Fidel's score, but like as an orchestra, it, yeah. it, it sounds terrible. And in the case of this, I, I wasn't a huge fan. I think I think of the approach of taking the popular song and put it into like an orchestra. But the end credits has a Ghostbusters remix, which kind of worked. I thought, why didn't they use that? In oh, that, you know? that's, I mean, the, the soundtrack itself is an interesting thing in that some tracks are brilliant and some tracks are, why did you do this? Like, why did you go with bloody Fallout Boy for the theme? Because it's god awful <laughs> when the Pentatonics one is better or the uh, one by Walk the Moon, I think it is. Walk the Moon. Um, I think so. But the score to this, I, I absolutely adore. I will just have that on at Halloween all the time because mm. I love its, its, its haunted mansion feel. This was this moment here with Leslie Jones. I think that was, I suppose, one of the, the, the film's, I suppose, handful of creepy moments. I don't think the film was scary at all. I think it's got a couple of good creepy moments. Yeah. Uh, with all the mannequins. I, and she says, oh, so that, room's, that rooms are full of nightmares. You yeah. Know, so, <laughs> um, I think it's a good gag. It's a good gag. Um, I was going to say, just before I forget about the score, when it comes to folding the, the song into it, what I think what, the reason why it works for me is that they don't do it throughout the film. They save it for that one moment. It's like in Mission mm. Impossible, where they hold off on using the film, uh, the score, just once or twice. And when they use it at the end for the massive tunnel scene in Mission Impossible, that gives me goosebumps every time I watch Mission Impossible and the, and the, 
depth score kicks in, just like it does for the Times Square it's battle. It's a little this. bit though, though, Paul. Though it's like how studios just like, well, we're going to have the theme, but we're only going to use it for like five seconds, and just like, <laughs> fuck off, give me the whole fucking big theme. You know what I mean? I want to hear. That's how I used to do it. Maybe, but then at the same time, the rest of the Ghostbusters song isn't particularly memorable. That little bit that we all remember that they use in the score is the only bit that could potentially work if you were going to fold it into a score. <laughs> So I don't, it's a tricky one, but I for me that works like gangbusters for me, as opposed to this scene, which which I like, but it doesn't have anywhere near the effectiveness of the Sedgwick scene, even though theoretically it has a better groundwork for a more epic battle. Mm. I don't, they, they, obviously the, the singer here is a stand-up comedian Adam Ray. I've been like I, I've been following him for like over a decade because he was doing stand-up comedy on like some bits on Facebook and YouTube and. Um, I think the last few years he's become a bit more popular. Obviously, Paul Feig sort of throwing him into his movies as sort of random cameos. So I, I was quite happy to see him in this. Yeah, um, um, I didn't know that because this is a proper band on stage. So what does he? Is he the front front? Yeah, the funk singer. Yeah. So he does. This is his he, band on stage, then. No, no, no. I don't, I don't, I don't think he has a band. He's a stand-up comedian oh. who does um, Mad TV. I think it is it's like comedy skits. Oh, like that. right. Um, do you think it was a little bit too far with throwing Ozzy Osbourne in to finish off the scene? Okay, so this is again, this is when it comes down to those... So in this film, uh, the, the line he says doesn't work. In the director's cut, he says something like, what the fuck's happening? I'm, com I'm coming down, Karen, or something like that. He says something which is far funnier than the director's cut, which uh, in than the theatrical cut. So it, again, me, I wouldn't have put it in at all because it makes it look like it's a Muppet movie cameo. And it's yes. almost as yeah. if to say, it, it's almost like going da 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 at the end of your scene. Yeah. They, they, they needed another punchline, didn't they? The they end. kind of did. See, this is where it's like, I think Paul Feig loves the characters. I think he loves the world he's created and I think he wants to have fun. And I think that does come across in this film. I think it just means that it's at odds with its ghost hunting, supernatural adventure side of things. But I would also argue that's the same problem Ghostbusters 2 has. I think Ghostbusters 2 is too sitcom-y and cuddly. So when the threat does come in, it kind of doesn't register as much because you kind of go, oh, I forgot about that. Because with well, Ghostbusters 2, I think, has more... I think a far more effective, scary moments, I think. Um, oh, see, this is where I disagree. I, 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 I remember... I remember thinking Ghostbusters 2 was too cartoony for me to find scary. Oh, really? Yeah. Because I remember you know, when he calls out to Winston, he's like, Winston, Echo's doing down the uh, in the underground, and uh, Janosch as a sort of Victorian nanny. Uh, nanny. You know, that was creepy as a kid. Look, the and, only um, scene I think is creepy in that whole film is where he goes, Janosch goes to see Dana, and she turns him away, and then he's standing in the corridor, and his eyes become torches and scan the yeah, hallway. And I thought, yeah. oh, but then when he comes back as the nanny, and it's apparently they only gotten to do it because uh, they were running out of time, so they just thought, oh, let's... They were going to make a whole creature monster, and they thought, oh, let's just stick Janosch well, in a wig. Because he can't... Because well, he can't be a ghost, because he's not dead. No. It doesn't quite make sense. <laughs> they, I love they're that breaking their well. own rules there. There we go. Hey, sorry, I can't pay for your guitar. I love that bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But then... Bang, cut to the montage. You don't need Ozzy bloody Osbourne there. Mm. You don't even need this bit, I guess, really. But I can see why they did it, because it's there. Well, this is the other thing as well that Ghostbusters 84 didn't really touch on, is that, oh no, did it? I don't know, I'm going off on a tangent again. Let's pick a different topic. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they have a montage today in this film. No, I they don't. No, they don't have a montage. Which is good. They've only had, they have one... Yeah, successful capture of a ghost. They become sort of pop. They become popular. Bill Murray sort of turns up, and okay, weird thing actually. Bill Murray because he had to do the press for this, didn't he? And he yeah. didn't seem at all enthused. And there was this discussion <laughs> that he was somewhat forced to do it. Is that true? Uh, from what I heard from Paul Feig, no. Okay. Paul Feig said they had this role written for him, and um, he said he'd like to do it, but. Because he's Bill Murray, they just didn't hear from him. And they just hoped he'd be there on the day, and he was. And oh, right. I, I think that's what it comes down to. The, the problem is, is that, from what I understand, 
Bill Murray didn't want to be a funny character in this. I think he wanted mm. to be the Walter Peck character from the first film, yeah. which is effectively yeah. what he does in this role. And I think the only problem with the character is that it, because they cast Bill Murray, it gets in the way of the importance of that scene, which is someone telling them once again that they're shit at what they do and it's all fake, and then they go a bit too far to prove it's real, and then they kill a man. And Bill Murray's been trying to kill himself off from Ghostbusters since 1985. There's a great Starburst interview where he goes, oh, I want to get killed off, and I, and I want to call it Ghostbusters Burn in Hell or something like that. <laughs> and he's really blunt about the fact that he just doesn't want to come back for Ghostbusters ever again. I, Hence, he, was, he, was, he was a right champ, though, when it came to Zombieland. You know, he was playing up Ghostbusters big time. And then when you see that wonderful clip, I think it was a, a silly MTV Music Awards, a, a film awards, yeah where he comes up the platform and he takes off the coat and it's the Ghostbusters outfit. Mm. Bill Murray doesn't need to be cool. He's always kind of cool, isn't he? He is. And he sort of plays into that. Um, he's just a big pothead as well, so I thought it was fun and music. I just wonder if he uses that as a kind of um, crowd stirrer. Because if someone's... He if, is, if, yeah. if they know, you know what I mean? He knows what he's doing. I think. Oh, yeah. You know. He's like a magician who's always got a pack of cards on him. He always knows <laughs> he can pull that out. <laughs> But, but it's interesting because, again, it's, it's like with Bill Murray. I mean, all the cameos in this, I'm going to say bar Sigourney Weavers, which I really love, are unnecessary and take away from what this film is trying to do. I do like I do like Dan Aykroyd's cameo because it's just a New York sort of accent. He goes, I ain't afraid no ghost. This drives off. And yeah. I thought that was quite amusing, you know. I, would uh, have... I mean, Ernie Hudson's great as well. Oh, Ernie's actually, great yeah. And, you know, and so. he... he at least gets to be, you know, he doesn't have to do... Oh, Annie Potts is fine, but she's just, you know, doing Janine, really, you know. But it's it's just one of those things where those scenes only exist because you need to get these cameos Yeah, in. yeah, again, it's, it's, it's playing on the familiar and it's playing on your, the fans and it's the little nuggets. It's like, it's like watching Ready Player One and you're looking for something that's, that was nostalgic mm. to you. Oh, but it, for Ghostbusters fans out there, though, I believe IDW did the comics, uh, did Ghostbusters 101, which had all the universes of every single Ghostbusters ever work together to defeat a threat. And so they come, up with, a, they come up with a logic that in this universe of Ghostbusters, you know, they're not Dan, they're not Ray Stans, they're not Peter Venkman, but their physical copies do exist in their universe, but they just don't know that in another universe that they are Peter Venkman or Winston Zedmore. It's just... Oh, I see. So, because yeah, the yeah. Gozor thing in 84 was a key moment in the franchise in that once it opened, it opened up every single parallel universe in the Ghostbusters world, which is why the real mm. Ghostbusters can meet the movie Ghostbusters, which meet these Ghostbusters, which meet the... Even in the comic book, they figure out a way to make the Ghostbusters sprites from the new Ghostbusters 2 video game as separate characters that exist in a universe. <laughs> So they got they got them all in. In fact, there's even a quick gag where in the background you can see the filmation Ghostbusters in the background in their jalopy. On their jalopy, amazing. Yeah, IDW's done more to grow the franchise of Ghostbusters than Dan Aykroyd ever has, and that's just wow. not me being facetious. It, it's genuinely true. I love those comic books because they build the world and they build the characters, and everything grows and develops as opposed to. Every single Ghostbusters, including these ones, is a reset of an origin story. So, uh, yeah, so it's one of the reasons why I get frustrated with this franchise, because it's always starting over again. Even when it didn't need to in its first direct sequel. Well, it's, it's the problem, isn't it, of uh, lightning in a bottle, isn't it? You try, it's, it's, it's happened with Robocop, isn't it? Robocop's oh, got yeah. the same problem, uh, where it's just a finite sort of finale to a film, and you think, oh my God, you want more, but you, you, you know in the back of your mind, where else can I go with this about repeating themselves? Um, and that's an, an inherent with the Ghostbusters, is that what we got with the sequel was a repeat. Um, yeah. And it was also, you know, as you were saying, Sony weren't really taking advantage of, I suppose, we didn't know what they had at the time, the Ghostbusters. Yeah. In terms of, like, a big franchise picture. Even when the film came out, there was no merchandise for it. It, was, it wasn't anything until we got the cartoon, which was, like, two years later or whatever. Yeah. Um, and in the case of, with this film, it was merchandise baza- you know, bonanza. Uh, for everything with Ghostbusters, um, I don't think people were that enthusiastic for the toys and stuff. I think the toys the, the actually sold packs, very well for this film, did they? Yeah, I no, they it was more did. Like proton packs and so forth. But. I couldn't get hold of one of those. That's, uh, well, that's a different discussion for a different podcast, and probably. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I, again, one of the problems I have with this is that I think Sony treat the iconography of this film like 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 stamping a Mickey Mouse ears on something because mm. everything every piece of 
merchandise I've ever seen for Ghostbusters is by is the, logo. is the logo or Marshmallow Man or Slimer. You know, and they get slapped on everything from fruit boxes to food. Like I went to B and M, and there's food, you know, cupcakes with Slimer on and the Marshmallow Man. It's easy to slap the logo of Ghostbusters onto things because it's one of the most recognisable brands in the world, even to this day. I yeah, think it it's, is. It's like the Superman logo, isn't it? And so forth. Yeah, and the Batman logo. Yeah, if they can just use the logo, then they're, they're, they're fine. It's fine to them. Mm. I mean, Andy, Andy Garcia, you know, I think he's quite good as the mayor. I like I like his performance in this. Yeah. Don't you dare call me the mayor from Jaws. <laughs> I thought that was good. That is a I good do. gag. That is really good. It's good um, because it hangs a lantern on that trope. <laughs> well, he's, he's the one who's in this mad world we've got. He's actually played like Charles Dance a straight mm. character um, and I think that I think the film kind of needed more of that um, I do think they needed more quote unquote realism in this film to yeah, rail against yeah. but again yeah. it's like the tone of these isn't too dissimilar to other Feig projects I mean yeah, true, uh, true. everyone gets a chance to shine I think in Paul Feig's universe of filmmaking but I think that can often be a detriment to the pace of a scene or uh, just the, what the narrative is in that moment Obviously, a sequel just will, will never happen now. I think down to how it was received. Yeah. I think obviously, financially and um, and the fan base being torn apart, and what if they, they accept it as part of the part of the legacy. Mm. Um, but I, I think if, if if they could do a sequel and they could address some of the issues that were kind of fundamental with this one, they they he, he could make it actually you know uh, a good film that would be that would please. I think both sides of the coin. Both, I think a sequel. Both sides of the fan base. To this would be delightful. Again, going back to the why they're dumping 80 million on, on, on reshoots for Justice League. It's like, I mean, the thing is, I think the budget for this is 110 million, I think, which is incredibly big for this film, if you ask me. The thing is, do you think that's inherent with this, like they just did so many reshoots to changing things? Or is it what with this? It's very much a heavy visual effects budget. I, I think because the, the back half of this film is heavy on a lot of cg all of Times square is is a cg set mm. all of that is done or do you think it may have been accumulated with other failed sort of productions or trying to get it off the ground i mean like, you know i mean just in terms of the cast involved they have their share of the cost you know you've got merchandise i mean it, it, there's the reason why these films cost so much and also there's a reason why ghostbusters afterlife has got almost half the budget of this um, he does because he? Yeah, I think yeah. that's the problem with it they should have aimed low and scored high because yeah, with a lower budget yeah. film you know you have more return with a lower budget film they could they could have played on more of the horror aspect I think a Ghostbusters film should just be on the edge of a family movie where it could be I, I think behind a Ghostbusters film now being a 15 they could easily get away with mm. um, but to them they need to maximise their profit. So a 12 is always going to be the, the sweet spot. But yeah. it needs to be like the high end of a 12 where you want parents sort of complaining, <laughs> you yeah. know, that my kid was scared, you know, but it's got away with it, you know. Yeah. So this, there's, the first Ghostbusters was terrifying to many kids mm. and it, it still works today with the with the librarian, with, with the um, the dog, the terror dog, you know. Um so it's this doesn't have any of that. I mean, there's a couple of, as I said, a couple of creepy little moments here and there, but it, it's nothing there that's going to scare a kid. I think. No, I, I again, I just, I, I think ultimately, I think the Paul Feig's vision for this was, if I had to use one word, romp. It's mm. it's a bouncy cartoon adventure. Yeah. And I think that's fine, but again, it all depends on what you think the franchise of Ghostbusters is, or what it should be going forward. Yeah. Yeah, and I think and that's. Do you think? Do you think that dealing with uh, the fan base that is there a lot of disputes on what they think it is? I, I think that the last person you should ask about what you should do next with the franchise is its fan base. I think that's fundamentally universal truth because you're never going to make anyone happy, and if you try and make them happy, you're not making anything you want to make. For what, for good or bad, this is the film Paul Feig wanted to make. You know. Uh, mm. The problem I have with Afterlife, and I can't remember if we spoke about this elsewhere, but the problem with legacy sequels is that you spend a lot of your time trading on 
familiar iconography. And when I saw the trailer and I saw the Goza dog and I saw all that, I was like, it just, I was just slightly underwhelmed, coupled to the fact that it's one of those small kid moves to a new town, gets bullied, doesn't fit in, but finds something within themselves which ends up saving the town or their friendships. And it's like, that's the Goosebumps movie. That's Casper. That's, that's just, it's, it's just any kid's film <laughs> ever. Where a single Which Casper mom... has a cameo of Ghostbusters, doesn't it? Or yeah. does Dan Aykroyd with a mustache? That made me know? angry as well. The, the, the very <laughs> idea, the very idea that the Ghostbusters couldn't catch Casper's uncles is offensive to me. <laughs> oh, amazing. So you want to talk about smears on the franchise? There's one. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh dear. But, uh, again, I want to go back into uh, again, this film again in terms of like what it's missing from the director's cut, which I kind of wish they'd kept for this, which is the beats between the characters, which gave them a little time to settle and find out about themselves. There's a great scene mm. where Abby and Erin talk about how they were bullied at school, and it leads off from a conversation where you find out about how... Um, uh, Kristen's character was called Ghost Girl and bullied, and it leads oh, into. Oh, because she a, saw that ghost in her bedroom. Yeah, which is a great little spooky yeah. story, actually. Which I again, I wish they'd just given a bit more time to breathe. That moment here, I think this moment here, actually, I think it was some of the best part of the score. Mm. It's very sort of it, it plays on the sort of the sort of creepy, sort of enhancing the sort of scene with a little melody in the background. I That's a definite uh, Bernstein influence, I think. Those yes. kind of the, where the score doesn't seem to fit the action, but fits the emotion. And that kind of feeling of discovery. And I, and I think what these films share in terms of their score is they never, as far as, as far as I'm concerned, they don't score the humour. They're always scoring the emotion or the action. Well, yeah, that's what um, many sort of composers say. They don't, when you, when you score a comedy, they don't score it like a comedy, mm. you know, to make, it, to make the, the score actually work. Yeah. Um, I think there's kind of a little similar traits with Paul Feig when he's in comparison to sort of director uh, Richard Lester, who, who kind of got thrown into doing Superman. But, you know, he did Musketeers and the Beatles films. He was known for doing comedy um, and uh, credited as sort of being the inventor of the music video mm. by MTV. Um, and I, I think he's follow follows sort of similar traits where it's he's very much he's trying to find a gang all the time. Yeah, I think with each <laughs> scene. Whereas um, I think Ivan Reitman's Ghostbusters is trying to find the scene, if that makes sense. They're trying to make it so when they finish editing, they've got enough there that the, the scene works, regardless of if it's comedy in it or not. Because, like, you know, as much as I love Ghostbusters, that film's got many, many problematic moments. I don't like the way they shoot a lot of scenes to push out Ernie Hudson's character from hero shots and things like that. I don't mm. like that... Uh, Peter Venkman's interaction with Dana in the flat in, the, in that first scene. Things like at the time you look back on and go, oh, the 80s. But these days you kind of feel like, ah, it's a bit dirty. I don't like it. <laughs> what he's like, you know, when you go, she go, he goes, no kiss. And she pushes yeah. him out the door. He's, he's getting a little bit too forward, isn't he? Um, and and he's, it displays his character actually very early on, isn't it? When he's trying to do that test and he's trying to, he's basically letting the guy lose because he wants to hit on this woman, you know? Mm. And it's 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 interesting to me that I think the the success and the curse of Ghostbusters is Bill Murray, because kind of without him that film didn't have that uh, that personality behind it that he obviously brings to. Because I don't think a lot of people would have gotten behind a film with just Egon and Ray catching ghosts. No, 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 no. Because Bill Murray, his dry sense of humour, that sort of is completely throughout the movie, and that's that's its style of comedy. Yeah, because that's the grounding element, which means the fantastical yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. is so rich to bounce off. But by the time you get to Ghostbusters Two, it does feel like um, he's sleepwalking through that film. Oh yeah, totally um, is. He doesn't want to be there. No, you know. <laughs> And I think that, in some respects, is what poisons the franchise. Because when you've got stories of, like, Dan Aykroyd sending him his script and then it coming back in the post torn up in a shoebox, you know, you've got things like that. So it kind of feels like, oh, uh, maybe if Bill Murray had never been in Ghostbusters, they might have been out for the bloody films by now and blah, blah, blah. Or... Well, yeah, if it was something like, I don't know, they, they replaced him with, like, uh, well, they cast Eddie Murphy instead at the time or... Yeah. 
it was it was John Candy was going to be Rick Moranis's yeah character was and it? apparently yeah. uh, he said I, I this doesn't work for me but I do know someone who would work and then re- recommended Rick yeah. Moranis which That's is a lovely right. story uh, because part of me does wonder what that parallel universe of Ghostbusters looks like I also yeah love, yeah definitely love all the I love this imagery I really like the color palette to this film the kind of Halloween blues and greens this and moment purples. this moment here works I love that the ghosts on the glass it looks like there's old holograms from the 80s like yeah. visionaries visionaries <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and yes, it plays in with the steampunk mm. design. I like that. I think it's good. And I do like the plot. I do like the fact that fundamentally, what it's about is kids, or not kids. It's about quote unquote losers and how they react to being a loser. So, like this, this guy has got the exact same backstory to some extent as our heroes. But you see where they converge. The problem is, is that the focus is on him being a incel type, you know, Arrested Development fanboy. And it's a comment on that. But actually, yes, but if that's all you're focusing on, you're losing the point of the story where it's like, it's very Mm. clear that Abby could have been this person because they're using the same technology. He's using the research to do all this. Well, yeah, she comments on saying this is very much the same as our stuff, obviously because he's been reading their their book. And I mean, again, I mean, Um, Ghostbusters, it doesn't... Okay. How do I delicately put this? It's got a great script. It doesn't necessarily have a great plot. And when the, the finale comes, it kind of comes out of nowhere in the last 20 minutes. Nothing really happens until Walter Peck shuts down the security, uh, the containment grid. And then everything starts coming out about Shandor and the building and the thing. And you think, oh, oh, this plot. Oh, the, oh, it's the finale now. Oh, okay. <laughs> so to some extent, at least this does have an ongoing developing story of two mm. different sides of you say You say it has a bit more of a solid middle act. Would you say uh, what this or eighty four? Yeah, this one. Uh, I would sort of justify the third act because the, the, the middle act has really got to wear. It's got to help lead up to the final act because you're, you're saying the original one just sort of the ending sort of comes out of nowhere, which I don't. I don't disagree with you on that. I I, I think it's sort of. I love <laughs> the randomness of the original one because no one in their fucking right mind would have thought they would have seen a giant stave past marshmallow man. Yeah, you know, sort of pop up at the end, which shows how crazy it is and what you can do with yeah. just the thought of I remember when I went to see that film know? when they cu- summoned the destructor and you see it crunching through the streets I closed my eyes thinking it was going to be some horrible demon monster yeah. so I closed my eyes and then I hear people around me laughing and I thought they were laughing at me because I was scared but they were laughing at the marshmallow man and when my mum nudged me uh, and I saw the marshmallow man I actually started crying because I got unnecessarily upset <laughs> 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 So, so uh, my only me- my only we're thinking, yeah, my only memory of like I never saw the films at the cinema. The first two, I mean, all I remember is my sister Emma, my older sister. She was it was also in eighty nine Christmas of eighty nine. She went to see Ghostbusters two, and she just go. Oh, I remember. So I was like, I'm leaving now. And I'd, my mum gave me this sort of banana flavored medicine. I just went, just threw it up. <laughs> but that's my only memory of Ghostbusters two. You know, it, it being around at that time. Yeah, it was weird. <laughs> Oh. But Ghostbusters 2 was a Christmassy kind of movie. That's the perfect time to release it. Why is releasing it in the summer of '89 in America is just bonkers. It's it's for me. Ghostbusters always felt a wintry film. In fact, it's interesting. Yeah, Ghostbusters seems like a wintry film, but Ghostbusters 2 is strictly speaking set at winter, but doesn't feel like a wintry film. It just happens to oh, they're wearing Santa hats all of a sudden, and it's New Year's Eve. Okay, and this feels very autumnal. This film is like does feel very Halloweeny. It's got it's got a because of its palette. Yeah. It's got yeah, a nice kind yeah. of New York in, in October feel to it. Mm. In fact, here's my next rant. Ghostbusters <laughs> needs to stop thinking it's a big blockbuster franchise and needs to start releasing itself at the end of the year, Christmas or Halloween. Because I think that's... I have no idea why Afterlife wasn't initially scheduled to be a Halloween film. It could suck up the box office at that time of year with kids. Same for this. Yeah. I don't understand why they thought this was going to be able to compete with whatever bloody Marvel film was out this year. Because it's, I mean, don't get me wrong, I love these films, but they're not what kids are crying out to play with in the... Well, yeah, because it's also, the, the, the idea of the film is about busting ghosts, and ghosts fit with, ho- with horror and Halloween, so you just think, oh, okay, well, it's got to be a an October movie. But I suppose it falls in the line with the first movie being a summer release, and they had to follow yeah. suit with, hey, this is the, 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 the time to make the most money. But at the time, um, you've got to remember, I, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, 80s summer blockbusters weren't quite the thing we knew 
the mask towards the end of the 80s. So, yeah, we knew mm. certain big films were coming out in the summer because of school holidays and things like that. But I, I would say it wasn't until the back end of the 80s that it, when it became like the scheduled part of the year where you got Back to the Future 2 and Batman and Indiana Jones sequels. Well, yeah. And because s- the scheduling was so off, wasn't it? Because you'd, in the UK, we'd have to wait like maybe six months to get the movie. Yeah. So it was all the, the release dates all over the place. And um, I was listening, oh, I've, well, I've got Adam Buxton's new book, but I was listening to his audio book. And he talked about Ghostbusters when it came out, and he was like, "It was, it was the first to him. It was the first movie just to be sold on the logo, yeah, just a poster being logo." And then obviously Batman copied it in '89, but it was such a different beast altogether. But it's, it's, um, it was that logo is probably the reason why the franchise has lasted as long as it has. If you want to boil mm. it all down to, if, if someone had to ask me to boil it down to what made Ghostbusters successful, I would say it was that logo, Michael C. Gross's amazing piece of art, which when you saw it for the first time on a billboard with nothing else, is striking. It's a striking thing to look at. Yeah, yeah. In fact, when people ask me what I like to buy when it comes to merch and Ghostbusters stuff, usually I'm a sucker for anything half decent with the logo on. So, like, (laughs) a badge, you know, an enamel pin badge or... uh, See, but were you a fan of the Ghostbusters 2 logo, though? Uh, Fundamentally, I mean, conceptually, it makes absolutely no sense. But (laughs) design-wise, I do like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I do li- I do like it visually. When I was at school, the first thing I ever made at like a shop class was a, a Ghostbusters 2 clock. And it, it's the logo with the dial in. But I loved it. For some reason, I really like Ghostbusters 2's logo, even though it f- fundamentally makes no sense. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're back, so we're doing a 2 logo. Or does it mean that they're being cool? I don't know. Well, it, it, it's, um, like, it's like if a company peace, went under for you know. bankruptcy. And then it came back a few years later, and all they did was stick like someone holding the two signs up to like Microsoft Two. You know, it'd be like having like the Windows logo with a pair of hands. But it'd be <laughs> weird like that. It's not something. <laughs> you do. Um, I suppose it, it goes in. It goes in the thing. That if, if I if I had to cosplay as a Ghostbuster, I would just wear the black darker outfit for Number Two just to be different. Yeah, you know, because you know that would be. I, my, I like that my dark. choice jumpsuit um i yeah, also i think it works i will say again this is one of those annoying things where the director's cut of this whole sequence is interesting because the scene where uh, abby gets possessed in the bathroom is far more haunting because in this really? you just see um in this you see her go to the bathroom because she thinks someone's after her and then the thing jumps out of the sink in the director's cut um basically the voice of uh uh what's his bloody name the bad guy in this i've got his name now uh, anyway him oh piss i'm gone yeah. But anyway, him. <laughs> <It's no good. laughs> Rowan. Um, he he's he's like he's like speaking to her in the pipe work, going, "Oh, I'm gonna do this to you, and you're a loser, and I'll teach you." And then like slime starts coming out of her nose and out of her hands and ears and mouth, and she's like pouring slime out of it. It's quite upsetting to Ooh. watch. And then she gets possessed fully, and then all this happens. But it was like. Keep that in, because it says lots about both characters in that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, odd. It's odd. Because there's, 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 they're all such great comedians. I think that some of their reactions are really good, like how they just sort of subtly react to something. It mm. works a treat. Um, I think this is a little bit over the top here with sort of, you know, floating around. And I, I don't know. They could. It's a little bit too... Um, they're, they're, they're demonstrating strength that they shouldn't have, you know. Yeah. Better pull someone out through a window, you know, pull back into a window, sorry, with one arm. It's um, it's that it's that elasticity of of the reality of the world you set up. Like for instance, this stuff yeah. with um with him wanting to be a ghost and then he gets possessed by Rowan. There's more setup of that in the director's cut because it set, it shows Ooh. his more he's more interested in joining the team and they keep saying it's it's not going to happen because you're yeah, a public liability. It comes liability. out of nowhere here, doesn't it? Yeah, it comes out of nowhere. Him just want to be a Ghostbuster. And there's like as a, uh, there's a fan in it online, um, which I might even send to you because I have it somewhere, um, which tries to do what it can to make this better, quote-unquote, which I've been saying a lot, quote-unquote. Um, and it's interesting because I think in that edit you see what the geek fan would do with this as opposed to someone right. who actually cares about structure and form because he edits jokes out that are female-based and if a guy made that joke, like the queef joke, which I don't really like in this film, but like how many fart no, gags... No, I don't think that works. No, but how many fart gags work in comedy yeah. films? You know, that gets a pass because mm. it's Will Ferrell. He cuts that out and replaces it with um, a Rickroll gag, which I think actually works better. You know, she comes close. Yes. 
And then when they do their first case, he uses the actual Ray Parker Jr. theme as opposed to Nine Inch Nails. But there's also edits to the story he puts in because apparently he's not interested in the characters. So all that gets hacked out as well. So it's just odd fan edit to odd as well because I think that says more about the personality of the person editing it than it does about mm. what they're trying to do I've never been I don't I, I expect people to do fan edits and stuff and I've been sent a few but it's often the case is that they sometimes cut out stuff I think is actually generally good mm. um, and people have asked me to do fan edits of particular movies I've talked about a lot over and over and over, and over again over the years um, but it's it's you know it's a lot of time and to put into something but obviously I'm not going to share it because it's kind of you know yeah. you can't really share it easily to uh the public, you know, but also the, the, pop- the, the Jaws gag. Here we go. The Jaws gag was great. Yeah. So, I, <laughs> that, so it gets a you know. But what total I f- pass from me that does. What I find interesting though is that when we get because we now live in a, in a in a world where you get your theatrical release, but then there's also a producer's cut, a writer's cut, a director's cut, a European mm. cut, American cut, a fan cut. You get to this point now where it's like, what is your vision? If Paul Feig released this. And then reads the director's cut. What is his vision? And so, mm, I, I kind yeah. of worry that we live in a, a, a we live in a period now where people are just tinkering the film because uh, either we can to make the perfect to make the perfect version in their own eyes, isn't it? But I suppose you know, if if Paul Feig's version is if it's director's cut, then it's I think that's his version. I think this is definitely the, the studio's version. Does that imply the that the theatrical experience is inherently anti-artist? You could you could argue that you know because um, if this if this theatrical cut that we're watching isn't really the one he wanted to do, but it was what the studio mm. wanted to put out. But then he released the director's cut. What does that say for theatrical cuts of movies in general? Most things, isn't it? It's most down to based on runtime, isn't it? How yeah. many shows they can squeeze in. So if it's going to be under two hours, great. Cause that was the same you mentioned earlier on with Justice League. Warner Brothers said to um, Josh Whedon, "It's got to be two hours. Mm. Bang on." That was it, and he's fucked and basically because he's got, now got to hack it to bits to get it to be a certain time. And it's um, something like um, it's now going to be released as four one-hour or six one-hour episodes on HBO. Something like that, yeah. It's very something like four to six hours, isn't it? It's runtime. I, um, I, I just. I mean, we have another movie, another Sony movie where it, the, the city uh, is it was based around one building and a tower. Like the Amazing Spider-Man. Yeah. What else did we see? Turtles. We saw Turtles. this in a number of movies, not just associated with Sony, but a number of films we've seen in the last few years. City in chaos around one building. Yeah. I will say this though: Ghostbusters gets a pass because I think it invented that trope. Because I think the first time you ever see it was in '84, yeah. and this can yeah, yeah. get around it because it sets up the groundwork of the ley lines and the building being a focal point. I thought everything. the ley, the, the lines and thing where the the, the 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 sort of the paranormal sort of. Uh, road structure or whatever it is, you know, the, the fault lines, as it were. Mm. Uh, it kind of works. I don't, I don't mind that. No. Um, what I will say is, though, is that this bit, which is it's Ghost Go Mad, the Ecto Containment Unit blew up in Ghostbusters 1 moment kind yeah. of copy, is that even though Ivan Reitman kind of shoots smaller, the scale of the film feels bigger, whereas this is different where the scale is bigger in terms of production, but it also kind of doesn't doesn't really get across the apocalypse quite well. No, it doesn't, no. It, it feels to me, it, 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 what we've seen throughout the film, even though it's kind of, it, there's a lot of exterior shots to show you the sort of scope of the mm. city, it still feels like everything's just like set-bound. Yeah, it's, you know it's, I mean? it's, everything feels set-y. Yeah, it, you know, it doesn't feel like a real, it's very like the mansion lot. at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. Like the, the mansion at the beginning didn't feel like a real place. It felt like just a set. Well, it so was I because I mean, the, the obviously the insides was, but that building is in Boston, and then they mm. superimposed it into New York for that ah, scene. So there you go. There yeah. you go. But uh, but yeah, this is this is an interesting moment where it feels like it, it feels empty when there's meant to be an apocalypse going on. Oh yeah, because obviously, they're, they're, obviously it's implied that they've evacuated the city, but they've done that in like an edit. Yeah, <laughs> you know, one edit, you know, it's gone. Yeah. Also, I kind of like. I mean, I'm I'm bored of Slimer. Can I just say that I'm so bored with Slimer as a character? Doesn't I think I think Adam Ray, who we saw earlier as the the singer at the gig, does the voice of Slimer. Oh really? Cause, I think because I know Robin goodness. Shelby, who played Ghost, who played Slimer in Ghostbusters Two, came back to do the voice of female Slimer in this. Oh right! She was specifically asked by Paul Feig, "Would she like to play Slimer again?" And so, uh, <laughs> so she came back to do that. 
uh, which made her day apparently because she's like she's well loved on the Ghostbusters fan communities Robin Shelby for uh, playing slime with <laughs> <laughs> But I don't know. She gets a pass by all the fans, then, basically. Yeah, and also <laughs> this this stuff kind of cuts around the finale because the ending to um, the director's cut of this basically kind of does the cross the streams things again, but then goes, Ooh. but that's a stupid idea. Let's not do that. Which is why. Wait a minute. Okay. So the end credits, right? They have the dance number, don't they? They feature some of it. Yeah. And obviously everyone's fi- in a fixed pose. Now, is that in the deleted scenes? That the dance number was meant. Yeah, that was cut out. And it is in the director's cut of this. And, it is. And I okay. think they were right to cut it out of the theatrical cut because it literally stops the action dead. You know, you've yeah. got all this stuff going down and then all of a sudden... But then it, when you see it, though, you can tell, like, oh, they've cut this bit because why is everyone, you know, has to be in this sort of fixed pose that's going to be obviously a dance number. Yeah. Now, this bit, sorry, this bit here about the uh, the parade and then the and the... Balloon pops its head around the corner and sees her. Yeah. That's a creepy moment. I like that. that they showed works. the actual drawings of the, uh, the parade fair that these are all based on, and they're even more horrific. They said they had to tone them down <laughs> because they, it would be too a little bit too scary for effectively a kids' film. And let's not forget, this is a kids' film, right? This is mm. fundamentally a film for kids. So this is. I I, I love that shot. I love. I, I love the fireworks of this film, which is why it's one of the reasons why I think it's got some really good ghostbusting moments in. Because th- there may be four minutes of actual ghostbusting in the original film, maybe five. Yeah, yeah. Where, I think yeah. The, the only extensive thing is catching slime, and then it becomes a montage. Yeah, that's it. And this has the pyrotechnics of the Times Square thing, which had never been done before in a franchise. There'd never been a scene mm. where Bill Murray's shooting one ghost while Dan Aykroyd's doing another. That was a real Ghostbusters mm. thing, but not necessarily a. Mm. Um, well, it's, it's in the in the video game, isn't it? They have a moment like this where you're running down the streets. It's all like carnage. It's all messy, and you've got Marshmallow Man kind of walking around, and then you fight these mm. ghosts outside a theatre. So I think this, it, to me, when I saw this, I was like, oh, that's kind of like in a video game. Yeah, which I, a moment I quite enjoyed. Um, <laughs> the video game's so. interesting because it's like if they turn that plot into a, into the third film. It, it, it would have been awful because I don't like the way they kind of shoehorn in the the, the, the the plot of one to two and try and make it work. You didn't like it, no? No, it's it's a great... Yeah. I mean, I prefer the Wii version of the game, if I'm being brutally honest. It's much more fun to play. It's just a lot more fun the to PS2 play. The PS2 one is the same, isn't it, as the Wii one? Yeah, and if you get the Switch yeah, yeah. one now, that the remastered, that is based on the, oh, the Xbox. Right, okay. Which is a shame they didn't put the Wii one out, because I, I think the Wii one's a lot of fun to play, but obviously, unless you have a Wii control, it's impractical to play. <laughs> yeah. But it was it was quite, it was was just more fun. Uh, had almost had the same kind of palette as well, and same kind of look. Mm. Um, I, it, the dance scene, definitely get rid of that. But this, to me... One of the reasons why I think I like this film way over Ghostbusters 2, and I'm not saying, I don't, I'm not trying to say that to be an edge lord. It's just what film do I want to watch more if I'm in a Ghostbusters mood? I'm probably going to pick this over too, because this shows me stuff like this, which Ghostbusters 2 never really did. Full on battles in the street using all kinds of grenades and chippers and things. Like it appeals to like the kid in me who would play in the in the, you know, in the schoolyard, and we'd all go crazy. And- I suppose this one has a lot more. You could say to sort of. As a kid, reenact yeah. with your friends. You know what I mean? Because number two doesn't have that. It just has <laughs> them controlling the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> yeah. which is they're static anyway. Yeah. Then they have to jump through this, you know, this uh, through this roof, and then they just get thrown backwards, don't they? So mm. there isn't much action. You know. I, I think the problem is, 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 is all of a sudden this film's gone from sitcom to Avengers, and I think the yes, whiplash. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, look, it ties a lot of stuff up. Like, there's the ghost from the beginning. You see Havoc, the demon ghost from the thing. It all converges on this, so it kind of ties itself up quite nicely. But Paul Feig is not an action director, and even if you watch The Heat and Spy, it's effective, but it's not so much... It doesn't do more than the basics you need Mm. to get that across. And you're working with CGI, and you've got this big green screen that you're working on, and so many things have to come into play. So many visions and 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 uh, editing and all this stuff that it's again it's like i kind of wonder what a more sh- assured 
action director would have made of this as opposed to a comedy director i suppose yeah, maybe he you know it depends how much if he had full control over these action sequences because sometimes the you know, director would just get a, get a a competent second unit guy mm. who's done action movies to do these things um yeah i have to sort of have a look into that who did second unit, but maybe paul had you know wanted to take control of that Mm, maybe I mean I, this is all the kind of just production stuff that I'm only guessing but it feels yeah, like yeah, all, yeah. at this point 17 different production co- houses are working on these moments and from mm. scene to scene they work but when you piece them all together yes. it doesn't quite but again this next bit now with with Holtzman and I loved all this I love all the ghosts coming out of the fog and I loved I love this bit. This bit generally, I, just now, I've just got goosebumps in the back of my head just from, <laughs> just from seeing it. Because it's just kick-ass. It's just awesome. And Dan Aykroyd never did this. <laughs> you know? It's yeah, it's it's something we, as fans, we'd, I suppose, as adults, would have loved to have seen Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray do this sort of thing, like in the 90s, mm. just sort of see them just being thrown into an action-packed sequence um, and also a lot of the ghosts in this, it's you know, it's it very much falls in line with the cartoon. I think. I think this. I think this has actually has has taken more ideas from the cartoon to a certain degree. If it, it probably fits with that. It's funny because Ghostbusters um, Two does that, but I think in Ghostbusters Two it's a detriment because it kind of the film almost goes. All right, we're a kids franchise now, specifically because everyone knows us from the cartoon mm. show, so we have to kind of appeal to that audience that have co- has come to the sequel from those cartoon shows yeah. where this is kind of almost cherry picking because I spoke to Paul Feig about this and I said from watching it I got a distinct feeling that Kate Dippold is the one who's really into um, the history and the ghost stories and the horror elements and I think Paul's really into the gadgets and the technology and the science of the world and he was like that's probably very true and I think that shows a lot in in the script because I think when it's being successful in this film, it gets that marriage quite right. Mm. Uh, I loved... I mean, it's, it's interesting because this is very similar, obviously, to uh, the ending of Ghostbusters with the building. Yes, it's, it's now approaching the, you know, Zool. Because I do wonder... Goza. I do wonder if that shot's been designed to look like the Goza temple because you can see how it kind of... the staircase goes up to a kind of oh, temple yeah, shot. Yeah. I just love the original design there with that sort of pyramid and stuff and it's mm. sort of... There's so much there to, to sort of... to pick... there's a sort of delve deep into but it's so... it only gives you little bits to sort of say, hey, this is what it is yeah. but we're not going to explain what it is, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's the sort of frustrating element. Um, but that's what, you know... That's what some good, that's what good films do. It's like uh, the jockey and Alien. It gives you a little bit of a, a hint at something, but it doesn't tell you what's going on. I think you know, one of the, the backstory is. Yeah, I think one of the things that's really up, kind of ruined pop culture is is the need to, to like dissect it too much. And I think yeah. when people go yeah. on about well, what we're doing now, yeah, well, <laughs> you know? I, I kind of feel like we're just talking about this in terms of what's it, what what was its agenda? Was it successful? Now, I would say that. Its agenda was to make a broad comedy that everyone can like, whether you're a Ghostbusters fan or not, using the iconography. And was it successful? Yes or no? Because, yes, I think it was successful in terms of what it tried to achieve. Was that what people wanted? No. And that's the problem with it, I think. Mm. Whereas, when people say, worst thing I've ever seen, worst movie of 2016, well, I can't believe this, that, and the other, it's like... No, 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 no. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of films that year that were far more incompetent and more egregious to sit through. Well, it's it's a bit when um, when people say something like, um, "Oh, Batman and Robin is the worst film I've ever seen." I'm like, dude, no. you've not seen that many films. No, then you really haven't. <laughs> you know, you've lived a really you know. good life. If, <laughs> 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 but also, I get upset when people get too angry about this because even to this day, people still will post on YouTube videos things like. Oh, I watch Ghostbusters back, and it's even worse than I remember. And I'm thinking, mm, but you're only going, you're only putting yourself through that for your YouTube channel, for your statement. So you're baiting, almost. You're almost like stirring up what pe- people feel about this film for your own ends, rather than have anything particularly constructive to say. Mm. Yeah, I, I suppose it's someone uh, playing playing safe. You know what I mean? To yeah. appease an audience, you know. But it's also boring because um, then I know exactly who's the audience for that channel, and yeah. I've yeah. lost interest. 
in your channel as a result. This is, this is interesting, right? Because as a kid, obviously, with the, the go- real Ghostbusters cartoon, it had the ghost walking down the street. Mm. And I thought to myself, when I saw this, I saw like a you know clip. I was like, oh, they're doing that. They're actually using the logo <laughs> thing now, you know. Uh, I actually kind of wish they had done that now because that would have been great. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been brilliant. Oh, I love that. I mean, I think this was a mistake to kind of basically copy the um, stave puffed thing, which is effectively mm. what they're doing. They- okay, so Paul. Okay, Paul. What would you What would you had instead then? Instead of this. Instead of yeah, just it had it would ha- it would have had to have been something big, large, you know, for them to battle against, wouldn't it? Well, okay, so that's only if you think that's how a film of this type needs to end. I would say it would be more interesting if Rowan, as a ghost, had these armies of ghosts to at his beck and call, and they just had to wade through wave of wave of them to get to whatever they needed to do to close. Because fundamentally, the ending of this is they close that hole in the ground where all the ghosts are coming out of by, you know, blowing up Ecto-1, right? Yeah. You don't necessarily need to have a Stay puff Marshmallow, you know, knockoff in it. They could have gone into the other, in, into the other dimension. Yeah. And then be surrounded by mad reality, this labyrinth of like these doors everywhere, pit like the game, I suppose. I guess they could have done that as well. Also, they could have maybe made a ghost, one ghost built out of the thousands of ghosts coming out of it, like some kind of gestalt entity. Oh. You know, like that. What was it? Okay. In the real Ghostbusters cartoon, there was that ghost that draws all the other ghosts into its stomach. Oh yes, there is. I can't remember what that was, but that's an early episode. That will, that creeped the hell out of me. They could have done kid. that, and they could have yeah, done that go. because that would have been more. That would have been almost the exact same thing, having a big monster, but at the same time, it's not a white marshmallow man. He kind could of have thing. been played by Mike Myers, going, "Get in, man!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor Mike Draws Myers. Poor Mike Myers. <laughs> um, so anyway, this whole ending it makes more sense because, as I say, they talk about not doing the crossing the streams. Instead, they lure this in. It's just this ending makes a little bit more logistical sense rather than Slimer just jumping into the thing for no real reason and then they blow up the mm. Ecto-1. That's me nitpicking because yeah. what happens after that, I think, is more interesting where it all of a sudden goes from big epic thing. Oh, look, John McClane. Uh, and then... <laughs> And then it goes to a really personal thing with just Abby and Erin and their friendship. And that, yeah. again, oh, look, Beyond the Fringe, you didn't notice that last time. Oh, that's cool. One of the things I do like when I watch this film is watching all the old references to the 70s or 80s New York that they stick through it. Or 60s, I can't yeah, remember. Yeah, yeah. I wish it had like a Virgin Megastore or something. Like <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. Or Tower Records or something. Something like that. Either way, it it's just, I don't know. I, I like I, I thought that was very cute. I wish there'd been a bit more of that. Or maybe made a bit more of the fact that they were in a different time or times were crossing over. They've also done a very pretty good job here with the sort of the green screen work because they don't seem stuck on in many of these shots. The, the, the FX team have done a really good job of, sort of, yeah. the, of the elements. And I think when people say it, 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 there's too much CGI, mm. they're probably thinking of this this moment. Really? Yeah, I'd say so. But like, how else are you going to do it anyway these days? Really, if you're going to be? Well, yeah, it's, it's it's yes, it's the huge cost involved. And I suppose if, if I suppose those naysayers, if they saw the behind the scenes and sort, I could see what actually what was live action, then may, maybe less um, critical. Mm. But I, I think they, yeah, Sony did a very good job with this. I, th- I think it's Sony Image Works doing the, the visual effects, but their earlier stuff wasn't particularly good. Yeah. They've, yeah, yeah, yeah. improved a lot over the last decade. And I think this 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 goes CGI heavy when it kind of needs to, because how else are you going to do this? The... It's IMAX, isn't it, at the end, isn't it? Yeah. Because the, the aspect ratio changes. Oh, yeah, I've just noticed that now. Because it's got all the black bars have just gone. And also notice that when they do the 3D, it comes out of the sides of the black bars, which I... Yeah, because I thought to myself, oh, is this playing... Am I watching a 3D one yesterday? But no, yeah. it shouldn't be, because the picture would be doubled up. Yeah. But, um... Yeah, this is, so this is the only IMAX sequence. I didn't. I didn't know what? That's the first time I've noticed that this was an IMAX sequence, and it say, seems yeah. weird that they'd save it for the last two minutes of the film. It, yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's peculiar. It's like when you watch like um, like you know the uh, the Dark Knight, Dark Knight Rises, or one of the Transformer films where the aspect ratio mm. just keeps changing all the time. Um, more so in the Michael Bay ones, where it's like one scene's IMAX and the next scene it's not. Oh, like, what, just make your mind up. What's going to be IMAX or not? Pick you know? one, you stupid. 
stupid bugger. That'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. It's either an IMAX film or it's not. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I like. I do like this 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 gag here where she goes, "Oh, it's 2040, and now the 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 mayor's a plant or something, yeah. or the president's a plant, or something like that." That's a good gag. Oh, what we'd give for a plant president these days, eh? <laughs> <laughs> as of recording 2020 <laughs> <laughs> and also here's the other thing i've realized about this is that you know in the first 84 film it's like it's a it's it's like all oh, the crowds are out there for them it's like yeah ghostbusters there's none of that here have you noticed that it's like i know it's yeah. such a it's such a kind of it, I, I i guess it's interesting in many respects but it also speaks to where uh, the logic of the film doesn't quite work because you'd think this would be swarming with a new york people going yeah, yeah that's why you, in the first one when they they pull up and bill murray's like hello new york yeah you know and you've got that great it feels it feels real like it's like like a like a documentary team are following them with a camera yeah um and then but yeah but then it's weird because because it, it's kind of nice in the respect that it makes it feel like these are still underdogs these are still people out to mm. prove what they can do despite saving new york and then at the very yeah. end of this film where you, they're on the rooftop of the firehouse and you see the buildings of new york light up to say thank you it's an incredibly mm. adorable scene as a coder to say oh they are appreciated and you know people do know i think again it's like okay so some people might not want heart and emotion in their comedy supernatural adventure but for me <laughs> one of the reasons why i was so I don't know. So oh, I, I enjoyed this film was because at the end of it, I wanted to hang out with these characters more, mm. and it's a shame we might not ever get to outside of you know comic book cashins. Although I'd love to. I've got this theory. I reckon at the end of Ghostbusters Afterlife, they're going to show a portal, and it will show every single Ghostbusters universe. And I reckon all the other Ghostbusters from this film will walk out. That's what, that's what I reckon will happen. And we'll just see like random Garfield walk past. Oh, I'd love it? that. <laughs> I'd love that. <laughs> oh, I and that, that was a great thing in Zombieland, wasn't it? When they says to Bill Murray, "What was your what was your biggest regret?" I don't know, maybe Garfield. <laughs> yeah, like, I, that was great. I, I I love the way the universe works sometimes, and the Garfield Peter Venkman, you know, yeah, paradox. It's so weird, isn't it? It, yeah, it is. It's so bizarre. Yeah. So you know, I, and Melissa McCarthy's grey wig there was really bad. <laughs> it didn't really fit on very well, did it? And the seams were completely off. Yeah, I don't mind yeah, though because like... to some extent it's like it's a gag, you know, and the, yeah. it pays off here. I guess it's one of those things where it's like it, 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 it it's hearts in the right place. Well, they they throw in a Garfield gag, don't they? Oh, they do because they about her hair. Yeah, how it's based after the cat, yeah. not the president, or the other way around. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, anything else I want to talk about? I'm trying to think. Because it's not like, as I say, it's not like I'm going to change anyone's mind with this commentary. I just wanted to talk about it in terms of... I, th- I think I've been... It was surprising because when, when I did see it, I, I, I didn't dislike it. and I, did, I, wasn't, I wasn't really angry about it. I was just like, it wasn't awful, but it wasn't brilliant either. I, and, and I've repeatedly watched it. This is like the fourth time now. Hmm. fourth being for this commentary i i do think it gets a little bit better here and there because it doesn't have the sort of the baggage of the hype yeah. and, the, and the reactions at the time and you can sort of just, just sort of soak it in and just sort of things have moved on mm. now um and I, I i i will give the extended cut a go i think actually and, give, and see what just what, what it what it improves and what actually kind of yeah. messes up in terms of changing scenes around i think it stumbles over itself a little bit more as a result but there, there are some things I wish had been in this version of the film that were in the director's cut. Just one or two scenes, you know, just one or two little things that would have uh, made the through line to the characters a bit more uh, mm. uh, real, I guess. But because um, I, I messaged my sisters last night, I've got three sisters, and um, two of the two of them are twins and they're younger than me, and one's older. So I, they all grew up with Ghostbusters and mm. Star Wars, Superman, and so forth. And I said to them, have you seen the new film? Because I wanted to sort of get their opinion on yeah. it. Two of them had, and they didn't like it. They they, they felt that changing the gender was wrong. Um, and I think they were most just against the idea of a remake. That was their biggest problem. It's um, it's it's odd, because like I, I fundamentally don't believe changing uh, the sex of a character, if you're rebooting a franchise, should be an issue at all. Because what does that say? That the fun, the, the, the starting point of every franchise must mean it's male-led. 
and I just disagree mm. with that completely. Would this film have had less um, uh, anger thrown at it if they'd cast one or two men as Ghostbusters? Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I, I, I always say that. I think at the time, maybe it would have been nice to have a split two men and two women. Maybe, but I then because when you when you throw Chris Chris into it, Chris Hemsworth. And you've got that sort of friction there going on that mm. she fancies him and stuff. That, it sort of adds another extra sort of development to these characters yeah. and um, spices things up a little bit. Yeah, but um, I mean, uh, look. But hey, this is what they could have explored in the next one. If exactly. They were, if that was going to happen. Because I honestly yeah, so, believe they would have grown this, you know, yeah. and, and made more of a, of, of, weirdly, of a franchise out of it by the time they got to a sequel. And they could have spent more time yeah. with Patty and, uh, uh, and uh, Holtzman in the sequel as well and develop that. But I mean, like fundamentally, I just, I, I, I disagree that, I mean, because again, it's Paul Feig's vision. He wanted an all-female group. He didn't see it as an issue because as far as I, he's concerned, why not? Why why must we have these elements that we use to placate people who might get upset? Now, I, I would, it would have been worse if they, if, if they'd been called Alice Spengler, uh, Petri Venkman, you know, uh, Carol Stance, <laughs> and they had done that. That would have been worse to literally push female actors into carbon copy roles. These are all new characters. It's a whole new world, all new gadgets. For me, I've wanted to see that since 1989. So, oh well, yeah, because as you say, you, all we had was like the sort of the slime, yeah, slime blowers, throwers, wasn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, great. <laughs> I guess there's. there's if I, you know, because obviously now with Afterlife, they are they're throwing in Paul Rudd yeah. into the mix. I think he, I still think he would have been a quite a good Ghostbuster as well. And um, but I tell you what, there's another chap, another, another comedian I really liked. Who I thought he would have been sort of, I suppose, a similar to Bill Murray's character. Mm. I can't remember the actor's name now. He's in tons of comedy stuff. Ah, I'll, let me just find his name. I, can't, I, never, I can never remember <laughs> it. He sort of has a weird. It's, Bollocks, I'll come back to that. But it's um, yeah. I mean, because if 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 they were going to do like at the time just having just thrown in guys, I suppose it would have just actually gone for things like Jonah Hill and and um, God, Jason Segel. But that to like me that, would be depressing. Make. I would hate to watch a Ghostbusters film with Seth Rogen in or Will Ferrell and you know that type because for all I think Bill that's it Bill Hader that that's it, actually name. Bill Hader is a great choice actually. I think he would have been a great Ghostbuster. Yeah, I think. you're right. Or bet- in one in potential one in future. But I, I hate. I, I would have hated to see a Ghostbusters reboot. That would effectively have been the same as this, but with Will Ferrell, Ben Seth Stiller, Rogen and, and I, 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 I honestly think that would have been much, much worse as a film. That's just my mm, opinion. Because I saw Neighborhood Watch, and that was a great example of oh, that would have sucked if they'd been Ghostbusters. Have you seen Neighborhood Watch? <laughs> no, I haven't. No, I didn't. It's Ben no. Stiller. Uh, who else is in it? Uh, uh, the guy who's in Freaky, that new horror film coming out, and he was in Jurassic World, Jurassic Park Lost World. What's his name? He's in Swingers. What's his name? Oh. What's his name? Oh, him. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I've lost my point now. The point is, I'd... <laughs> I'm happy we got this. I'm, I'm not the dude bro, uh, early 2000s improvised comedy male acting troupe version of this. I think this makes it yeah. more palatable to me. I think their version might have been a bit more gross. What this film does, I suppose, to its benefit, is like they're not having women act like men. No, in terms of like, like the, the jokes are written for men. Oh, but they're just they're just women. So yeah, um, there is that sort of there is a there is still like a, a you know a number of female led comedy films that actually are that. Where they're just having women act like men, and I, I, I don't think that's that kind of works for me because having grown up with three sis, three sisters, they have their own sense of humour and how they do things, and, it, and it's funny, mm. um, and that's what makes a great sort of parallels between male-led comedies and female ones. Um, but obviously, Bridesmaids does have the sort of women sort of acting like men to a certain degree where. It's, the toilet humour often comes into play, and I think it works wonderfully. It works. It works well in that because um, I think he doesn't have to worry about making a family film. It's like I would have. This is, I think, Paul Feig's probably first 
family film, isn't it? Because like Heat and Spy yeah, yeah, it is, are all... Yeah, and it's, one, it's definitely the one the most risk for him as well. Very much, because he's also creating something that fundamentally isn't his. It's, you know, his, his new characters, his new world, but the branding, the iconography, it all goes back to Dan Aykroyd. So it would have been interesting to know what would have happened if they'd said, oh, make it a top end 12, maybe a 15, go for that. Because there is one or two F words in the director's cut. Um, oh, there is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which land? Did you ask Did you ask Paul Fig that, did he sort of, just sort of shut himself off what was going on, on online and social media, just focus on what he wanted? I mean, during the shooting or, or the pre-production? Yeah, during the shooting, um, really, I suppose. I think they weren't unaware of it all. But my impression is, is that Feig wanted this and he was going to do it no matter what. I think maybe one or two lines they threw in about bitches ain't going to catch no ghosts and things like that were based off what they'd heard online, but didn't necessarily fundamentally change how he ch- how he filmed the film itself. Because oddly, yeah, the film had the sort of the fake title, didn't it? Or Flapjack. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, because obviously they do that so they the people don't get catch wind of their shooting Ghostbusters and also they can shoot locations for cheaper. It's, it's, you know, they always do that. Like, I think Batman had like was Intimidation Game or something like that. And I mean, I, Return of the Jedi was like famously Blue Harvest yeah. or something like that. And uh, right. I, I, I can imagine that helped to some extent to keep the. I mean, I don't know how you wouldn't get confused with a bunch of women in pro on packs on their back and go. <laughs> you they see made the car. Is that like Ghostbusters? No, 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 no. We're making we're making a casualty movie. Yeah, <laughs> we're making a film about <laughs> evil flapjacks. But I think. But the thing is, is that when people say this destroyed. Ghostbusters or the franchise potential. I'm going to say no. I'm going to give you a theory which I can't back up other than friends of mine who are in the industry have said, but it goes like this. So I don't think without this film we'd even be getting Afterlife right now because I think the discussion that this film brought up, for good or for bad, was like YouTube metadata analytics where it's like up or down, positive or negative, people are still talking about it. Now, Ghost Core was set up to create a Ghostbusters universe. And before this film came out, they're also talking about an animated movie, a kids' TV series, all these kind of things. This film came out, didn't perform as well as it could have. And so, all of a sudden, so you were like, well, if you can't figure something out, Ghost Core will close. Which is why I think they rushed Afterlife into production. Because... There was tens of scripts that just didn't work. But all of a sudden, Jason Reitman's has. That seems weird to me. So it feels like Mm. Afterlife is slightly cynically become a legacy movie because Jason Reitman's taken over from his dad or the old crew are back. It carries on from 84. We can forget everything. So it... Do you think, though, Jason Reitman's the right guy to be doing Ghostbusters? Because in my mind, I think someone who grew up with Ghostbusters very much in the middle of it, in the thick of it as a kid may seem I, 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 part you know, of me as a gamble a pretty good gamble it's it's a gamble I mean, the thing is i remember reading reviews and interviews with him whether he was breaking through with films like juno and thank you for not smoking yeah. that he was he was always yeah. saying i'm not a blockbuster guy i have no interest in doing blockbusters i don't really want to do a ghostbusters cut to him doing a ghostbusters and part of me wonders <laughs> if if it's kind of been dumped on him because he said mm. all of a sudden i had this idea for a script and I wanted to make it, and now we're making it, and I'm thinking, that's fine and well and good, but this is so not in your wheelhouse. Even your dad had made mm. some comedy films and worked in exploitation beforehand. Well, because Evolution, wasn't it, was supposed to be this kind of uh, spiritual kind of thing to Ghostbusters, and it kind of bombed. Yeah, it? big time. Uh, it was meant to be a full-on proper horror movie, and then as each director came on and left the project, it got softened down until Reitman came on and went, oh, I'll just make Ghostbusters again. Beat for beat. <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty much, yeah. pretty much. So if you, That's a film actually I need to explore again in future. I, I, maybe I'm we should do Evolution and I could talk about how it's basically yeah. Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, we should do that. That's a good idea. No one talks about Evolution. Yeah. No, they don't. But maybe for good reason. Maybe for good reason. But, <laughs> but, like, but, if, but if you want to ask me where the success of Ghostbusters goes going forward, it, it, the sh- it's all on the shoulders of Afterlife now. Because yeah. I reckon this film will grow, and over time, because like you know how many remakes come out, like Total Recall and Robocop, and we just don't talk about them now. At least we're still no. talking about this in some respects, and it's yes. still finding yes. audiences. My um, nephew and nieces—they're only like eight or nine—they both love this, and so I'm hoping people 
find this film and enjoy it without the baggage of it being part of a franchise. Yeah, but, yeah. Because I, I have a friend who works for Sony, and uh, he said he's seen quite large chunks of Afterlife, oh. and he's been very impressed. But then, you know, he works for Sony, so he does. <laughs> you know, you have to sort of take with a pinch of salt. But I, I, I do trust him though. He's he has a very good, very good opinion on things. So I'm, I, uh, fingers crossed. What he, you know, what what Jason has done mm. is is sort of delivered. But then it's to me when I did see the trailer, it was like a it did feel like an, a react a reaction. To things like Stranger Things, and that's yeah. kind of why I'm like, mm, that's my know, I'm on the fence. concern. Not only is it I don't trading really on, really want to see kids as Ghostbusters. Well, no, I want to see Egon, Egon <laughs> even says in Ghostbusters too, a proton pack is not for kids. He says it to Bobby Brown. Exactly. Yeah. And look, they, they mention Gozer at the end, the zoo, so it kind of yeah. all links the multiverse together. So at least they've done that. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Any final thoughts, Paul? I'm trying to think. Look, if you've gotten through this in, this whole commentary and all it's made you do is maybe want to watch the director's cut, then that's all I can ask. If you hate this film, that's fine as well. But my big takeaway is, if you hate it, fine. Don't go online and tell other people they can't like things because I bet you're the guy who's now basically... Not you, Oliver. I'm talking about someone listening. <laughs> the person who's complaining about this is probably the person who's about to dump a load of money onto HBO to watch Justice League's Zack Snyder's <laughs> Cut. And if that's true, you've lost any argument with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think I've, I, I, I had addressed my thoughts on this movie throughout. But yeah, it's I, I don't hate it. There is still funny moments in it. I, I, I will give the extended cut a go. But I think the fundamental problem was that it was just the tone of it yeah um that's not right and it, and it sort of doesn't really it, i think it should have played itself a little bit more straight um yeah and i haven't had comedy in it but sort of not rely on it so much as a crutch but um and focus yeah. on the horror more i think that's that's a sort of going forward with other ghostbuster movies is play it a little bit more straight and add more horror into it so, so, yeah. so it's on the teetering edge of being a 15 or say r-rated movie but gets away with being a, a pg-13 or 12 it does feel like Feig was making uh, an R-rated comedy for a family audience based on a well-popular franchise, and no matter what he could do, which is tough to it do, was, it, it was going to be tough. tough. You know, it's tough. And there we go. I love this film. It's become a fate with my 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 family and my nieces love watching it with me because they know I'm a Ghostbusters fan, and now they have their own pro on packs. It, it, it's not a franchise killer, but look, end of the day, if you're really upset maybe go and sit down and watch a few episodes of Filmation's Ghostbusters sitcom and then get a bit of a bit of bit of balance <laughs> <laughs> well everyone I hope you enjoyed the commentary me and Paul will be back with some more very soon take care everyone and goodbye goodbye <laughs>